Well, very good, folks. Uh, once again, welcome. Uh, we, this is the uh, workshop on business entities titled, uh, I Need to Choose What? Uh, Why the Right Business Entity is Important to Your Farm. Uh, and uh, my name is Rob Holcomb. I am an extension educator in ag business management with the university, and I am uh, officed out of Marshall. I'm happy to report that I am now in an office and I'm not at home. Uh, that is a that that is a monumental monumental event uh, uh, at the you know what I hope is the uh, nearing the end of the pandemic. Joining me today is uh, Nathan Halinski. He, uh, Nathan is a colleague of mine. Uh, he's uh, off out of Brainerd. Uh, he's been helping. Me, well, he's been more than helping. He's been uh, you know been a been a instructor uh, working with this program uh, from the from the onset. And uh, this is more or less uh, what I'd consider the the cleanup meeting for uh, for for the workshops that we've been doing for this particular program. So uh, you know, I see that the crowd continues to to uh, grow here a little bit. We just, we're going to take care of a few housekeeping chores here, uh, folks, to begin with. For for those of you that responded uh, uh, to my request, uh, we we had some print. We had several printed books. Uh, in fact, I still have a pr pretty healthy quantity of those things. Uh, we we mailed books out to everyone uh, that that provided us a, uh, a mailing address. Uh, if you didn't get one of those and you would like me to mail one out to you, just you know shoot me an email and I'll I'll provide my email address a couple times during the program here. But uh, material wise, uh, for most for most participants, you had your Zoom link that that uh, either arrived on Friday or this morning. And uh, along with the uh, the handout. Now the the handout uh, the the booklet handout went to everybody. Now I will say, please, it's very big. Don't just send that thing to the printer because it's sixty some pages. Uh, I would uh, I would recommend uh, you know not printing that thing uh, uh, unless unless you really really desire to do that. And then there were there were a handful of other handouts that uh, that uh, were sent out with the with the link on that. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, and again, we're, we're talking about business entities. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're going to start off today talking about why choose a business structure and what are some factors to consider in, in deciding whether or not you want to, you want to have some type of a structure other than a sole proprietorship. Uh, we'll talk about uh, basics of business entities, uh, you know, just looking at all the different entities and talk a lot about uh, advantages and disadvantages and, and uh, circumstances where one entity might work better than another one. The after lunch part of it uh, and and the the basics discussion we kind of do that up until about lunchtime. Uh, we will take a break for lunch, uh, and then after lunch we're going to do more of a deep dive. And what we're what we'll do on that is we'll we'll look at all the entities and we'll we'll specifically address characteristics of those entities, how you form those entities, what type of uh, you know how they operate on a day to day basis, and uh, also we'll talk a little bit on taxation and corporate farming law uh, along those lines because uh, because certain entities are affected by that. Now, uh, for the for those of you that have ever worked with me before or uh, or have attended any of my workshops, I work pretty much exclusively on the tax on the income tax side of things I do a huge amount of uh, income tax education both for tax professionals and for farmers so uh, uh, I've been accused of you know put, putting a lot of tax information in this I'm trying to tone it down honestly but but I think there's important tax things that we need to talk about as we go through these uh, these items Real quickly on our agenda, you know, we're starting here at 10 o'clock, uh, you know, from, from now until noon, we basically want to go through these factors and the, the, you know, go through all the entities and just kind of give you a, give you a from 30,000 foot level. We are going to take a 45 minute break for lunch. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that of course, in an online environment is going to be on your own. 
the uh, we we do have uh, right before we break for lunch, or either right before or right after, we we do have a little bit of a case study that we want to talk about, and we'll we'll uh, come back and we'll talk a little bit about this case study, and we'll try to do the best we can with that uh, through through uh, chat and and uh, the Q and A functions of the webinar. The uh, well then then of course after lunch we'll get into this deep dive, uh, talking about all the all the entities, and then then we have another. Uh, short case study discussion that we'll engage in at the at the tail end, and my hope is, uh, you know, the the webinar the webinar version of this does tend to run a little shorter than the live workshops. The live workshops we tend tend would tend to run till three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm anticipating we're going to probably be wrapped up somewhere around two fifteen two thirty somewhere in there. So. Before we get into too far into this, I've, I always want to do a little bit of a Zoom primer, as far as uh, as far as uh, uh, so you're able to manipulate. Now we're we're well into the pandemic, and I'm guessing that you folks are all pretty familiar with with Zoom features and everything. But uh, uh, along the bottom of your screen, you've got that you know picture of that little microphone. Now, of course, that's uh, you know that's for muting. Uh, your video now we and we we have video shut off for everybody so that's that's kind of irrelevant in regards to that but we have we do there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen and I guess uh, with with the size group that we have I think we could probably take care of most everything through the chat uh, there's also a Q and A box and I'll I'll watch both of those but I think we can probably take care of stuff through the through the Q&A, excuse me, through the chat box. Uh, so if you have a question or something, or, or uh, I'm asking for a response, uh, try, try, to, uh, try to send those messages through the chat box. And that way we only have to watch the, uh, the, the one item. Uh, I do wanna point out in the lower right-hand corner, you've got that button to leave the meeting. Now at the end of the day, when, when we are, when we're basically, done uh I, I my preference is is that everybody clicks that leave meeting button that is going to trigger the uh, course evaluation to pop up automatically for you we have an electronic uh, evaluation slash survey that we'd ask everybody to fill out it's very short uh, but what we're trying to do is, is gather feedback. Uh, this is a grant funded project. So of course I have to, I have to report feedback from the, from the uh, programs, but I'm also anticipating that this is a program that we're going to continue to offer even after the grant expires. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that, uh, that evaluation will pop up when you hit the leave meeting button. If you don't leave the meeting, before I end the webinar for everybody, you won't get your evaluation that way. Now, now that said, I will either this afternoon late or first thing in the morning, I will send out another evaluation link to everybody that's attending the webinar today, just in case somebody miss, missed uh, the ability to fill that thing out. Now, given that information, please folks only fill the evaluation out once. Uh, so if you if you fill the thing out this afternoon, if technology works okay, and I send you a link tomorrow, and you've already filled it out, just just ignore the email, please. So uh, here's my contact information, and uh, I'm uh, as as I said, I'm I'm office out of Marshall. I work an awful lot with income tax uh, education. I've been a I've been a credentialed uh, tax professional for over twenty years. And, uh, and I head up all the education programs for, for income tax for the university statewide. My phone numbers, uh, uh, and this without trying to get too complicated, I mentioned earlier, my, I've, uh, our office has moved. Uh, so my, I have a current phone number that is still ringing through uh, to my cell phone. But uh, that phone number this week is going to change to the new phone number. And uh, I, I do not know when they're going to discontinue the old phone number. So you, you might want to jot both of those down. The new phone number is not in the printed material. Uh, honestly, the best way to reach me 
uh, this time of the year, since we're in the middle of tax season, is via email because email catches up with me everywhere. So I uh, just uh, if everybody can jot that down if you if you feel so uh, so desired. Uh, we've got uh, these were the folks that were originally part of the program. Uh, Megan and Amber, unfortunately, are no longer with uh, with Extension, but uh, Dave and Dave and Nathan Nathan's with us today. Uh, these are all ABM uh, team members. Well, I do want to acknowledge some of our collaborators on this project. Uh, Rachel Armstrong is the director for Farm Commons. They are an, a nonprofit organization. They're headquartered out of. Duluth, and they work an awful lot with farm legal matters, of which business entities happens to be a major component of that. Uh, they uh, they do a lot of workshops. They have a they have a website where, and they do have some free information on their website. They also are a subscription website. Uh, that's that's how they fund fund their programs but you know as a resource if, the, if there's something you want to follow up with uh, later on you know farm commons is definitely something that you want to consider we've also partnered on this project with uh, minnesota state university farm business management program or more commonly known as the fbm program uh, we've we've worked with all the instructors on uh, promoting and hosting these programs uh, uh, statewide and i certainly want to acknowledge and and thank uh thank the FBM program for uh, for their participation with this. This grant, this uh, project was funded through a grant from the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center out of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, so it's, U it's a USDA funded project. I'm obligated to let you know that because that's, uh, that's where the money came from to, uh, to fund this particular project. The uh, one of the final things I wanna talk about before we get into material is uh, uh, I, I encourage everyone to be a good consumer of professional services. Uh, and this is our disclaimer. Uh, we offer this workshop as educational information. We don't offer legal advice. I am not an attorney. Uh, I am, I've, I've been an enrolled agent for, for uh, 20 years, but uh, which, which entitles me to, you know, I can represent tax matters in front of the Internal Revenue Service for a client but I am not an attorney. And uh, I encourage folks, when, whenever you're talking about doing a formal entity, like what we're talking about here today, oftentimes you're going to have accountant stuff and you're going to have lawyer stuff, All right? There's a, there's a distinct difference. Your accountants typically are not going to be able to practice law or they should not be practicing law. So you're going to involve both an accountant and an attorney in order to get this drawn up. Do not go online and get a template to just set up and set yourself up an LLC. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's, there's companies online that, uh, you know, you can go to a website and you can get a template and everything. That's really not a good idea, folks, uh, especially from the liability standpoint. You don't know whether that documentation is going to hold up if you, end, if you end up in court or not. So, uh, you know, the amount of assets that we're talking about trying to protect, be a good consumer of professional services. The uh, want to uh, start off here, and I think this is a good discussion to a good, good way to start our program off today. Uh, in the chat, uh, and, and what I would ask everybody uh, that, that's, uh, that's out here online, uh, if, you, if you could uh, uh, indicate to me kind of what your expectations are for the program. And of course, this would be much easier if we were face-to-face, -face. But, uh, but in the chat, uh, you know, send, send a chat and just indicate what, what is it that you're after uh, what are you trying to, what are you trying to learn? What are your expectations for uh, today? And if we could get some, get some uh, feedback on that, uh, that would, that would help. And I'll, I'll certainly share that with everyone. And certainly don't be bashful. Okay, we've got uh, next, next generation transition and, and, uh, uh, and I, I will, I, I will say, uh, on next generation transition, there are some entities that do make it easier to 
transfer assets to the next generation. That's, that's not, I, I do want to clarify, that's not our focal point today, but, uh, but we are going to touch a little bit on that. Uh, I'll mention for five minutes, you know, trusts, but we really, we really aren't, aren't talking about trust. That's our, that's our farm estate transfer workshop. And if that, you know, that's something that we definitely want to get you in contact with. Um, okay. Other options other than sole proprietor, see what's mo see what makes most sense for moving on. Uh, looking to learn entity to choose, been farming, uh, actual business, looking to grow full-time, be an actual business, next generation transition, okay, liability and estate planning. Uh, oh, this is great. I, I, can't, I can't get to the ball, but uh, uh, these are exactly what I was hoping to hear. So it, give, it gives us a good idea of what, what you folks are after. Appreciate the, uh, I greatly appreciate the participation on that. Uh, folks, I do have, uh, when we when we set up the, uh, when I sent the link out, I was uh, asking everyone uh, if, if, they, uh, if they had never done a Zoom before to uh, download the Zoom app. I'm gonna launch a poll. Actually, actually I'm gonna launch two polls. I want, I, I'll, first of all, I wanna indicate uh, on your screen, you should, you should be seeing a poll that uh, is asking what form of business entity you're current are you currently operating under, and if you if you could get everybody to weigh in on that, the uh, that would that would help that helps out a little bit as far as the discussion goes regarding the uh, uh, where, what direction I need to take uh, everybody in that uh, in that regard. And we'll just give everybody a little bit of time. The uh, you know and 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 the the problem is if you're not seeing the uh, if you're not seeing the poll, you probably would have needed to have downloaded the Zoom app. That 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 that's a requirement to, for polls to work. Uh, we're we're hovering about ninety percent, so I'm going to go ahead and end this, and I'll share the results. Overwhelmingly, we are sole proprietors. All right, with a, with a small amount of partnerships and uh, a few LLCs in that regard. So that and that that has been probably the cookie cutter. Uh, type of uh, scenario that, that we've seen when we've done these workshops. Now, number three, uh, what we want to do, excuse me, the, well, because the, the first poll was was the, what we did in the chat. Number two, we just did. Number three, just asking you, why are you consider creating a formal entity? Uh, and I'm, my, my assumption is, is that since you're involved in this today, uh, you know, just I'm curious what what type of uh, things that you're that you're interested in, or what what are your motivations towards uh, wanting to look at another entity? And those are coming in nicely, rather nicely. Okay, give you about uh, five more seconds on that, folks. And uh, and there might be. Uh, there might be some other ones. Okay, we're nearing that 90 percentile. So I'm going to go ahead and end this and share this. And this is this is a scattergram like I kind of like I kind of uh, was expecting. Uh, you know, some are just interested. Well, we got, you know, uh, 13 of the of the 36 are uh, interested in what's involved for farm transfer, liability protection, income tax benefits. You know, want to combine forces with other family members. So then, and we're going to talk about all of those, all of those. So, uh, and, uh, and I guess in the chat, uh, com comment was made here, uh, the uh, nonprofit formation to support community and be uh, grant eligible for a business entity support the nonprofit. That might be a little, a little deeper than what we're going to get today, but we'll at least get you on the right track to knowing what the, what the different type of business entities are in that regard. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and close that out and let's move on with the uh, move on with the program. Nathan, um, if you're up for it, uh, shall I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let you uh, share your screen. Is that going to work for you? Yeah, let's uh, give it a try here. Okay. Oh. All right. There you are. And uh, go ahead and have at it. Um, 
Are we seeing the full screen? You are. You are. You're coming through great. All right. Sounds good. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. We have a pretty big group with us here on a Monday morning. So we'll go ahead and I'll speak for about a half hour here on just why choosing a business structure and just some factors that we need to uh, look into. So this is the list uh, of factors that we're going to walk through this morning. So the biggest one that we'll talk about is this liability concern. Um, and we'll leave it at that because we'll get into more details. And then taxes, right? They say the only two things avoidable, unavoidable in life are death and taxes. And, uh, you know, everyone has to pay taxes. Different entities can be taxed differently. Some have tax advantages, some do not. Um, so we'll just kind of walk through and throughout uh, this morning and this afternoon, we'll get you a pretty clear indicator of which ones have some tax benefits, which ones don't, and if that's a good fit for you. Ownership, management, um, you know, who, who's the boss when we set up some of these entities? Authority, formalities, capitalization, right? How do we get money into this uh, business structure? Or how do we uh, put assets in there? And we had a, a lot of people say that the transfer and estate planning it's kind of why they're on the call today and just talking about how we can use some of these business structures to help with that farm transition. So we'll talk about that. And then lastly, is just some government programs and we'll just talk about that when we get there. So the first one is talking about this liability protection. Okay, so we have a picture of a car crash, right? So, you know, what do car crashes have to do with farm business entities? Right, so I think the best way to help explain this section is to just kind of go over a horror story, you know, a worst case scenario, just to see the importance of, of some of this liability protection and liabilities that, that just exist. So let's just say that uh, you, your, your employee, someone with the farm is hauling grain into town, right? This is a, a typical event, nothing out of the ordinary with hauling grain. But as you, you know, come up to a stop sign, no one's ever coming on that particular road. So you just kind of coast through it and continue on your way. As you do that, though, there happens to be a car there and you hit the car, right? You hit the car, you smash it up, it rolls in the ditch, you know, and potentially the, the driver of that car gets injured or killed even. Right? So with that, again, worst case scenario of a car accident with a death, is there some liability concern that the farm has, right? I think the easy answer is yes, but, but how much, right? How much liability concerns exist and what can we do about it? You know, and, and typically in a car accident in case like that, you know, if the, the farmer driving the green cart or semi, whatever we're gonna call it, if they were at fault for failing to completely stop at the stop sign, the insurance that gets involved here, you know, the insurance for the car driver is probably going to want to get reimbursed for the car, potentially for, you know, a life if it was lost. So do we have enough, you know, is that a liability concern? Okay. And I think we'll, we'll go on to the next slide to continue here, but this liability protection that some business entities have, not all of them do, we're gonna help differentiate as we walk through today, but this personal liability protection states that if you get an uh, accident like we just shared, your personal assets are protected. So that's to say they sue the farm for you know, the car wreck. That um, other insurance company, if they sue the farm, they can only come after the business assets and not come after your personal assets. Maybe your personal assets include your personal residence. Maybe you have some retirement accounts. Maybe there's some a lake cabin. Things like that not associated with the farm can be protected. Okay, so again, um, we'll go explain a little bit more about this later, but in order to maintain that personal liability protection, you know, proper maintenance of this 
corporate veil needs to be upheld. And we'll explain that a little bit more, but a real brief explanation is that corporate veil is this making sure you are acting like you're an actual business, right? Having separate checkbook accounts, having these annual meetings with minutes of those meetings, you know, the board of directors. And again, we'll go in more detail later. So again, to wrap up this slide, right? Liability can be financial, can be uh, injury as well. But then that last bullet point, right? The idea of liability protection is not to be confused with a replacement for good comprehensive business insurance policies, right? So we're not saying get this, you know, set up a corporation, get your liability protection and drop your insurance. That might not be the best risk management strategy, but keeping this in mind, as some of these business structures have this liability protection. Taxes, right? Again, taxes are pretty, pretty hard to get out of. And different entities are taxed differently. And uh, a C corporation, right? We'll kind of jump around a little bit here. The C corporation is taxed at the entity level. Whereas the other corporations and LLC, sole proprietorships, partnerships, S corporations, they are not taxed at the entity level and they have passed through taxation where the income from the farm goes um, to the owners of that farm under their personal income statement. Whereas again, that C corporation has an entity level taxation where the net income for the farm will pay a flat 21% tax rate, and then uh, stocks, uh, rental income, or other benefits paid to the owners of that C corporation is also taxed on their personal income tax uh, return. So they, the C corporations has this double taxation. Um, and again, we'll get more detail later, but most of the other entities are passed through taxation, where again, it goes from the business and they pass that income through to the owners of that business. And then that final bullet point talking about tax law changes, right? Just what's accurate today, you know, in two, three, five, 10 years from now, tax laws can change, right? We had that fairly substantial tax law change at the end of 2017. And that was kind of the first major change in uh, 20 years or so. But, you know, the current administration always talks about, oh, we want to change some of this, change some of that. So tax laws can change. So bear that in mind, your business structure decision is going to be more than a, you know, two to three to five, 10 year uh, plan, right? You probably want to set up this business structure and maintain that business structure in the long term, even though tax laws uh, can change and change potentially the tax savings that some of these have. Multiple owners, right? Again, when we talked about the initial poll this morning, a lot of you were interested in bringing in multiple owners and how that works with farm transition, right? Ownership and a sole proprietorship is pretty straightforward, right? You have a sole proprietorship, you know, they have, um, they own it, right? It's not super complicated. But as we look into these different business structures, ownership can be more complex. You know, definitely when we get in multiple people, even multiple families, and then multiple enterprises here as well. So we'll kind of keep going here, right? So different types of business structures have different levels of flexibility, right? So an LLC can be very flexible when it comes to ownership, whereas a corporation, uh, might be a little more strict, a little more rigid, a little more difficult to, to change some of these things, right? Depending on the bylaws of that business. So in a limited partnership, a limited owner has no management authority um, within the partnership, but they have the benefit of no business liability beyond what they, you know, the percentage owned in that business. Okay, in a, in a C corporation, some corporate bylaws have non-voting shareholders. Okay, there's still a partial owner in the business with profit sharing or profit potential. They have no voting rights. And therefore, you know, really no 
management authority, right? They can't vote on whether the business should expand or, or grow more corn or wheat or expand into cattle or expand into hogs, right? They're just kind of a silent partner. Okay, so ownership can differ amongst our different structures as well. And kind of continuing on with that, you know, who is the boss? Right, you know, do we have business meetings? Um, you know, individuals do not conduct the business of an entity, right? The entity conducts the business following the, the policies set forth, you know, with that business's formation. You know, owners must understand that it's the entity that conducts the business, not the individuals who own the business. So, you know, moving on with that, you know, who is, who has this authority? Okay, we talked about that corporate veil right away, right? Who has the final say, right? We must keep formal separation between what we do as individuals and what we're doing as an owner of this business entity. You know, record keeping and written agreements, you know, should be a part of this and they will help, right? You can lay out before you get started here about who has, you know, this individual authority and over what section, let's say it's a, a dairy farm, Who's in charge of the breeding program? Who's in charge of the, the feed rationing and, and what and when and how much to feed the cows? Who's in charge of the planting on the, on the operation, right? All these different sections, maybe you have different people in charge of it, or maybe the same person is in charge of everything. Okay, but again, keeping these things in mind, these business formalities of when you set up this business structure, Again, are we acting like it's an actual business formality? Um, and uh, my brief uh, comparison is let's talk about General Motors. Let's talk about Apple, these large New York stock exchange companies where you know they have these quarterly meetings. They have these minutes that you can read through and say, hey, this is the direction that the business is going through. Do you on your farm do any of that? And that's part of that corporate veil that I keep alluding to. Right? Farms are a costly business. There are a lot of assets in the farming world, right? You need to have a lot of assets in order to farm and be a functioning farm, right? How about the value of our assets, you know, would be taken into consideration, right? Land, that's a very expensive asset, right? As you move across the state, the value of land fluctuates greatly, but you know, it's not hard to say it's you know five thousand dollars an acre, you know, against a large swath of the state, even even more, you know, maybe even double that, right? So we have a lot of assets tied in with this farm business. And how do we incorporate that into the structure? What about livestock? What about machinery? And all of these things are increasingly costly bringing up the value of this corporation or this farm business and what can we do about that what about crops right we're seeing some pretty high commodity prices as we speak which increases the value of these farm businesses okay so it's important to consider how money and assets will be put into the entity you know whether at formation you know, during the, during the operation, you know, what are the owners contributing? How do you become a partner? How do you become an owner into this farm business? Do you have to throw in some land, you know, that you own personally? What about the tractors, machinery that you own? What about the cattle, right? How do we become owners or partners into these businesses, uh, you know, uh, structures that we're talking about? You know, what about, you know, these current or intermediate or long-term assets, right? We'll talk about this a little bit later, but sometimes putting land into incorporation is a bad idea. Sometimes it's not. And we'll again, explain that as we go along today. Okay. And then the last bullet point here, what about taking out debt, right? How do we, maybe if we want to buy something with the farm, does this uh, going to be a, a a loan in, the, in terms of the business structure, a personal loan that's gonna be rented out to the business structure. How are we going to do this moving forward? And again, 
estate transition planning, secession planning, right? That was a big talking point we found out this morning. There are two very common times in the farm life cycle when a business entity is considered. Number one is when we're starting a new farm or farm business. And number two is during this transition process, right? You know, if you do plan on transitioning your farm in the next few years, you know, it, it, it is important to look at some of these structures and the benefits that they can have, right? There are some pros and cons here that we'll walk through. Right, a business entity can facilitate shares um, or units of this LLC or corporation to the next generation instead of purchasing individual assets. So let's just say, you know, I want to go into my, my parents' uh, farm. I can buy 1% of the business this year, another 1%, 2% next year, instead of saying, I want to buy, you know, this tractor this year, next year I'll buy a combine, next year some cows or some land. That percentage transition might be an easier way to do it. Okay, we might have some protection here with the retiring generation. Also gifting um, can be gifting or sales of assets or units can be discounted into this closely held um, farm business, right? So the, the discounting in some cases is because of the lack of marketability with these small held companies, right? If you're an outsider, well, let's just compare it to Apple or, or GM on the stock exchange, right? Anyone can go out and buy those shares. We know what it's worth, right? You go on, you know, the stock exchange and you can see, wow, Apple's worth $200 a share or whatever it is. How do you come to a final valuation with some of these closely held small family businesses, right? It, it's a little bit more difficult to come to a final answer right? And who would want to buy a share of this farm, this, this family-held farm, if you are going to be a minor, minority shareholder, right? You're only going to be having 10% of the business, and you have no authority. You have no voting shares. You can't really tell the farm what direction to go. So discounting of the value of some of those assets um, can also ease in the transition process because it's a smaller dollar amount for the incoming generation to purchase. We all recognize these uh, logos and, and companies or departments of our governmental entities on the screen, right? Typically, you know, farmers work fairly closely with FSA, the Farm Service Agency. Let's just think of our farm bill programs, right? We have, you know, dairy margin coverage on the you know, dairy cow side of thing. We have ARC, we have PLC, right? These different farm bill programs that to be elected into, right? You need to enroll through the FSA. You know, similar there where we have NRCS, we have the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. What can we do with these? You know, or how are these important, right? Typically, um, let's just talk about the USDA those payments are typically limited by an entity at $125,000 per year. And that's not a small number, right? Most or some farms say, you know, we don't get that high, it doesn't matter. But some of our larger farms out there, they might be encroaching on that upward limit in some years and choosing a entity, let's just say an LLC, they might be limiting themselves to one payment per year of $125,000. Okay, and again, maybe that's not a concern, but maybe for some of you, it is. Whereas in like a partnership, each individual partner gets that $125,000 limit. So going from a partnership to an LLC, for example, you might be dropping your maximum USDA FSA payments. So just we want to keep that in mind, right? This active engagement matters, right? We want to know who you are going in business with, right? Uh, and we do wanna pay attention if you start a partnership, potentially if one of the partners has, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a watershed or a conservation disagreement or, or um, something against them that can 
be difficult for the whole partnership. So make sure you know who you're going in business with. And then the final bullet points, uh, some of the uh, CFAT payments, you know, the, the coronavirus payments that were paid out in 2020, 2021, the last couple of years, some of those did have higher uh, entity limits. I think a lot of them, they increased up to $250,000. Um, so there is some flexibility yet, but we don't always know that uh, going into it. And kind of in wrapping up, right, we just went over these things, not in a whole lot of detail, but factors that you guys need to consider moving forward with, you know, the pros and cons of each of these, right? It's a liability protection that you want on your farm, or you don't think it's a real big issue. Right, a sole proprietorship, which most of you guys are, do, does not have that liability protection. And we're not saying it's a red flag to not have it. We want to make you aware of that it exists. You know, similarly with taxes, right? Some have some tax advantages, some don't. So we'll walk through each of these in a little more detail on the different entities uh, moving forward. And kind of in wrapping up here, your factors to consider may be different than another farmer's factors to consider. So the bullet point here, right, the final line here is there is no one right business structure, right? There's no, you know, one size fits all. This is the only way to go. That's not true at all. Um, so that's why we're showing you, you know, we'll go over roughly, you know, 10 different entity structures today and how each of them have some pros and some cons. So keep that in mind. Um, as we're moving forward. But uh, that kind of wraps up my section here this morning. So Rob, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So if, if you could unshare and All righty. Let me pull my uh, apologize, folks. When you when you unshare, it makes all the boxes go away. So I've got to pull everything back over here. All righty. Yeah, Nathan, just check if, if you could ch check check the chat there. I mean, you 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 you've got a really wicked echo where where you're sitting right now. I mean, that uh, uh you know, if you got a headset, that's fine. If not, we'll we'll make do. Uh what we have here folks uh you know moving on in the in the program and uh for, and for those of you 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 figured that out by now that uh, you know if we mailed the books out to you you've got that you've got that book in front of you. The, this is kind of moving into the section on the basics of business entities. And uh, the, the question that always comes up is, do you have to have a formal business structure in order to run a business? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. Uh, I've, uh, you know, in, in, in my years of uh, working with producers and serving as a consultant and a tax consultant, I can, I can say emphatically, some of the most profitable producers that I've ever worked with were all sole proprietors. Uh, they were considering moving to something a little more formal, but, but they, they certainly operated very successfully as a sole proprietorship. Now, personal liability protection. Nathan touched on that, and, and I can't emphasize that enough. That's probably one of the leading reasons that people will move to a formal entity is, uh, is that liability protection. Nathan talked about, you know, a, a vehicle accident example. Uh, as, as I've uh, been doing, you know, pro programming has been opening up a little bit and I've actually uh, had the opportunity to do some traveling the last month. 
And uh, as I've been driving up and down the road, folks, you know, one of the most dangerous things that farmers probably do, you know, in the spring, in the fall, when you, you know, in the spring, when field work rolls around, you get that big tractor with that uh, tillage implement on the backside of that thing, and you put it out on the highway, even with all the flashers, uh, that, that, that's just a, that's a terribly dangerous thing to have going on. And, and yeah, somebody hits you is probably not paying attention, but that's just the world we live in. Uh, the fall, we got the same thing. You put that, you put that combine out on the road again, with all the flashers and everything, uh, you know, we hear about, we hear about those, the, the, the farm implements getting hit on the road all the time. And, uh, and that, that's a liability concern. More and more farmers have, uh, have purchased semi, uh, tractors with, uh, with a, uh, with a grain box for hauling grain to town. And, uh, that, and again, another farm vehicle on the road there, the, the idea of, of, uh, personal liability protection. And, and we, we want to make sure we define this really carefully. Liability protection through an entity is, is not doing away with the liability. What it's doing is it's protecting the personal assets from being on the hook to satisfy business liabilities. All right. The assets that are in, you know, if, you, if there's a accident and, and uh, something happens, you got insurance and everything to cover that, but assets in the entity itself they're fair game for a lawsuit. What you're trying to do is you're trying to protect your personal assets out there, your home, your vehicles, your retirement plans, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, that, that's the idea of, of the liability protection is we're trying to protect the personal assets from being on the hook to satisfy business liabilities. And then, uh, you know, the tax benefits, we'll get, we'll get more into the tax benefits as we move along. Here's what we're going to talk about here this morning. And, th and this, is, this is essentially the, the discussion up till, up till lunchtime. Uh, we'll talk about a sole proprietor, qualified joint venture, general partnership, limited liability, company partnership and limited partnership, the family limited partnership, and then we'll touch on C&S Corporation. The, uh, and this is just the list. I mean, we're not explaining really anything on here. Let's just start with the, with the sole proprietorship to, to start with. And, and, it's, uh, and this is the simple one. It's the one that just about everybody started out as even the folks that even the folks that are corporations now probably started out at one point in time were a sole proprietor or or an heir or a ancestor of theirs was a sole proprietor. The uh, it's easy to set up. It's easy to get into it. It's easy to get out of it. The thing that you got to realize is that uh, the there is no separation between the owner and the business in this case. So there is zero liability protection if you're operating as a sole proprietor. Uh, if something bad happens within the way of an accident or something where uh, you know where there, where there was a lawsuit, those personal assets are equally on the hook to satisfy those business liabilities as opposed to the assets that are in the business themselves. Of course, there's going to be no corporate formalities and we'll get more into corporate formalities a little bit, a little bit later, but, uh, but, but the personally you're on the hook for those business liabilities and personal assets are available for that. Now here's, here's an option that, uh, doesn't get talked about much. I guess it's it, it came on the scene. Uh, we, we started talking about it about 10 years ago, quite a bit in our tax schools, because, uh, you know, practitioners had questions on that, but that's a qualified joint venture. Now, a qualified joint venture is actually a, a form of business. Uh, it, it has to be a married couple. Uh, and that's the limitation is it has to be a married couple that is essentially splitting the farming operation into two halves. Uh, say if you had a husband and a wife, uh, the husband would file a Schedule F on their 1040 and the wife would file a Schedule F on the 1040. You have one set of books and you, you just chop it in half. 
the the husband files half of the income, half the expense, half the depreciation, and the wife does the same thing. Now, largely the benefit that you have in, well, there's actually a couple benefits. The, 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 the most significant benefit uh, that I see in doing this is uh, you're getting you're getting social security, AKA self-employment tax paid in both the husband's name and the wife's name. Uh, so both, both, both individuals in, in, a, in the uh, farming operation are getting social security credited to their particular account. Uh, the traditional going back to the 1960s model where uh, you know the, the the husband filed the schedule F, the husband claimed all the social security unless unless the uh, unless the other spouse was uh, working off the farm, there was no social security getting uh, getting credited to to their account. So that's probably one of the one of the largest benefits that I see out of this. Uh, additionally, uh, Nathan touched a little bit on the uh, the, the the farm payment limitations. Uh, in this case, where you've got a qualified joint venture, the, you know, both spouses are entitled to the $125,000 limit, respectively. So you, you're essentially doubling that with a with a qualified joint venture. So, uh, so that that's one other benefit to this. Now, this can be done with either a farm or a non farm business. So for instance, if uh, Say, for instance, my wife and I uh, ran a uh, an unincorporated hardware store here in Marshall. Uh, we could file this thing as a qualified joint venture. We could just divide the books in half, and I claim half of it. And my wife Susan claims the other half, and and uh, you know we we could file that as a qualified joint venture under those under those circumstances. So, uh, but but it has to be a married couple. Has to be a married couple. All right. Next item that's up here is the general partnership. Now, uh, it, not to oversimplify this, but a, a general partnership is more or less just a sole proprietorship with more than one person involved with it. Uh, you know, it's, and it's going beyond the uh, the uh, qualified joint venture. Uh, oftentimes, you know, it can be neighbors, it could be family members. Uh, uh, a lot of the a lot of the returns I've done, uh, you know, partnership returns turned out to be brothers. Uh, that that just that's just the 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 history behind. Uh, you know, the experience that I guess I have with, with general partnerships. The, uh, the setup is generally pretty easy. And the, the benefit of a partnership is that you, you're able to kind of pool assets. You're able to, uh, you know, you've got two people working on the farming operation. So it's, it's a little easier to manage that workload. And of course, you got more assets in there because you got assets that are going to be contributed by more than one person. Say in this case, we had, you know, two brothers that were in partnership. Well, you know, you got two people pooling assets rather than just one all by itself. Now, the uh, there is essentially unlimited liability with it with the general partnership, uh, just like it is with the uh, with the uh, sole proprietor with the sole proprietorship. The with with the uh, in fact, it, it, it's it's actually detrimental. It's actually worse than the sole proprietorship because. Uh, if uh, you know, if I were in partnership, say say Nathan and I were in a farm partnership together, the uh, and I did something just horribly egregious. I went out and you know, say say I I I went out and caused an accident on the road and opened us up to to litigation and all kinds of liability concerns. Nathan's assets are also on the hook for my mess up. All right, so so there there's no clear line as far as oh, oh, only Rob Rob's assets are going to be on the hook here. It's Rob's and Nathan's assets that are going to be on the hook for uh, for that particular mess up. So uh, so that's one thing about general partnerships that you have, that you have to watch out for. The plus you got that potential for personal conflicts. I mean, the day and times that we live in, folks. Uh, you know, you can can have some disagreements and some conflicts and everything. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that is a potential where when you go into business with uh, someone, you know, 
there, there could be something that happens down the road where, uh, there's a conflict and, uh, and you, and you end up, uh, not, not, not doing business together anymore. Now, LLCs, the, uh, the LLC is a limited liability company. Don't confuse that with limited. It, there's no such thing as a limited liability corporation. It's a, it's a limited liability company. Uh, and I'm going to use the term LLC, uh, pretty much from here on out. Now that is a separate legal entity that uh, gets filed uh, when, when you set these things up, they get registered with the Secretary of State in, your, in the particular state that you're residing in. And uh, it can be one person or it can be multiple people. Uh, and it's, uh, you're, you're not limited in that regard. So you can have a single member LLC uh, and it, uh, you know, and you still have that LLC. It, uh, if you have more than one person in there, it gets treated as a pass-through entity. The default taxation for, an, for a multi-member LLC is as a partnership, meaning that uh, there's a set of books that income gets, gets uh, distributed out to the owners or the partners in this, in this particular case. Now, there is liability protection with the LLC. There, uh, it, and it's similar to what you get with a corporate entity. So the the reason why a lot of folks get into and re, and let me say this again: the reason why LLCs are so popular is that you've got the liability protection. And essentially, it operates like a general partnership. There's there's no corporate formalities. There, there's still stuff you got to file every year with the Secretary of State, and and uh, there, there's a little more to the tax return than than a sole proprietorship. But you don't have the you don't have to have the corporate minutes. You don't have to have the the issuance of stock. You don't have to have the bylaws and all that stuff that you have to have with a corporate entity. So that's largely one of the reasons why the LLC is so popular is that it's simple. All right, and that's going to come up in a in a discussion. Uh, uh, moment, you know, a little, little bit later here uh, this morning. Now, the limited liability partnership, which is an LLP, all right, LLPs uh, have to have two or more people involved. You can't have a single member LLP, but uh, the uh, typically, typically the model for an LLP is usually a professional office, uh, such as a, a, an attorney, a dentist, a doctor, along those lines. And, and here's the reason why. The limited liability partnership protects the assets of the individual partners from each other. All right. Let's let's say, for instance, let me give you an example to explain this a little bit better. Let's say that uh, Nathan and I and maybe don't, I don't mean to pick on Nathan, but uh, he's 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 on the webinar today. Uh, let's say that Nathan and I were attorneys and we were in uh, practice together and I just did something horribly egregious uh, in, in the law practice and opened ourselves up for a lawsuit. If we were operating as an LLP. All right, only my assets are on the hook for that uh, litigation. All right, because, you know, because it was my mess up. So it's only my assets that are going to be on the hook to satisfy that, uh, that liability. His are actually going to be protected. And, and that's, that's one of the key functions of an LLP. All right, otherwise it functions very similarly to a, to a general to a general partnership or an LLC for that matter is it is it's a pass through entity. Uh, you you can uh, uh, excuse me the uh, you know so you get the liability protection without the formal corporate structure and uh, you know and the pass through is going to be uh, the the taxation is going to be passed through taxation. So that's the key thing now. For a long time, I thought that, you know, the farm, there's really no application for this in the farm. Well, 
beginning to see some farms that are organized this way. And uh, so, so it's, it's something if that liability, you know, if that liability protecting yourselves from, for, from something that the other partner did, you know, that's a, that's a potential, uh, potential option. Taxation wise, it's no different than it would be with an LLC. There's no tax advantages to this. It just, it's just a different way of organizing to protect that liability uh, fr from, from uh, each other's partners. Okay, now the limited partnership. All right, this is a different one. Uh, you, you don't want to confuse this one with a limited liability partnership. Uh, in the limited partnership, you're going to have limited partners and general partners. Now, the, the, the key distinction here is the general partners are uh, general partners in a limited partnership really have no liability protection. All right, the, the general partners are the operators of the business. They are the, they're, they're the day-to-day -day operations managers. And, uh, but, but in, in, a, for liability protection, general partners, you know, they're, they're, they really have no liability protection. It's the limited partners that have the liability protection in a limited partnership. So, uh, so that, that's, that's one of the key things in this, but the limited partners don't partake in management of the business. All right. They're typically investors that, uh, you know, they, they put money in there. They're, they're on the hook for the amount of money that they have uh, invested in the business. But uh, if, if something happens along the lines of a lawsuit, it's not opening up uh, anything where, where uh, anybody can come after their personal assets. Okay. The, uh, and question, questions coming up, uh, uh, the uh, questions coming up as far as the uh, pass through entity and what what pass through taxation is, we got some graphs coming up uh, that are they're going to explain that. That's more of a that's more of a part two type of thing uh, as far as the as far as the uh, deal. So that's a that's a fair game question uh, as far as uh, as far as the uh, material goes. The um, okay the LP okay as far as the LP goes the limited partnership. Uh, typic typically got to have at least two people and, uh, but you're going to have in a, in a limited partnership, you have to have limited partners. You have to have general partners. Uh, typically it's going to be in a business where, uh, where the, uh, operation is existing and you typically have, uh, uh, investors that are, that are investing in the operation. This one is very, very seldom are you going to see this in a farming operation. We opted to talk about this because we didn't want to leave anything out. But uh, uh, any of the any of our Minnesota folks that are on the that are on the webinar today, uh, if, if anybody has ever been to the cities and gone to Valley Fair, all right, the Valley Fair uh, amusement park actually operates as a limited partnership. All right, so you got you got your general partners that uh, operate the park. And then you've got the limited partners that are investors. All they're interested in is a return on their money uh, in, in that regard. So I, I, unless, unless you've got a really large farming operation where you have outside investors coming in, it's, uh, this, this is probably not a real good fit for the, uh, uh, probably not a real good fit for, for the farming operation. Now, the, uh, the, the other also listed on the slide here, you've got the LP, which is the, the limited partnership. There's also a variation of that. It's the limited liability, limited partnership. And frankly, folks, you're going to have to sit down with an attorney to, uh, to figure out uh, all, the, all the nuances of that one. Uh, question that was, that was here uh, on the pass-through taxation, and I'll address real quick. What pass-through taxation is, and we've got, we've got a graph coming up uh, shortly on this, but any partnership is going gonna, is gonna to have a set of books for the partnership. And out of that set of books, you're going to determine profitability. All right. The partners, when the partnership is set up, you've got profit sharing percentages that are established. All right. If Nathan and I are in partnership together and we're a 50-50 split, that means he's going to get half the income. I'm going to get half the income. The partnership, re the partnership doesn't file, the partnership files a tax return, but it doesn't pay any tax. 
right? The income flows from the partnership to the partners, and then it gets reported on the partner's return. So when we talk about pass-through taxation, that's what we're talking about, is the entity itself doesn't pay tax. The money flows from the entity to the individual 1040s, and that's where it gets reported as income. All right, and I hope that, uh, I hope that that would be, uh, I hope that would, that would explain a little bit on that. Um, and yes, the comment comment from a from a person uh, here says, would a limited partnership be used more in a corporate farm setting? Absolutely, because you're going to have to have the limited partners are going to be largely outside investors. They're going to have nothing to do with with uh, running the farm. So it's uh, so yes, that that would be more of a corporate farm type of type of setting, and that's and that's a wonderful way to to label it. Okay, now the family limited partnership. Uh, what we have here is uh, the uh, on on an FLP. This one is used pretty much exclusively as an estate planning tool. And a uh, little bit of what's going on here is, in order to have an, a family limited partnership, of course the 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 shareholders all have to, excuse me, the partners all have to be family members. Now, the typical thing that happens with an FLP is it's, uh, it's, it's used to preserve generational wealth. Largely, it's used as a gifting instrument. So here's a scenario, a common scenario for a, for a family limited partnership. Uh, mom and dad are still living. Now, let's say there's three kids. One of the kids is uh, is interested in uh, in continuing to farm the to to operate the farm. Uh, what mom and dad do is mom and dad put all the land into this family limited partnership. Mom, dad, and the three kids are all going to be partners in this. All right at at the time that they at the time that mom and dad contribute that land into the FLP, mom and dad have most of the ownership. In fact, all the ownership. Well. Every year, what happens is, uh, you know, you, you folks are all aware of the, uh, you know, there's an annual gifting limit of $16,000 that you can do. It's, it's a tax-free gift. It's not even reportable. Uh, gifts in excess of $16,000, you have to file a, file a gift tax return for. Uh, may not be money due on it, but, but you have to file a gift tax return. Well, Every year, mom and dad are going to gift each of the kids, you know, dad's going to give $16,000 worth of land to each of the three kids. Mom's going to give $16,000 of land to each of the three kids. So, you know, over time, you know, you can, you can transfer a lot of ownership that way. All right. And, and this partnership, this, this family limited partnership is the mechanism that oftentimes is used to help uh, to help accomplish those gifting those gifting items. Now uh, we'll get into discounts a little bit later, but uh, but this is one of those scenarios where uh, uh, discounts might be uh, appropriate. Uh, typically, typically assets can be discounted because of lack of marketability and minority ownership. All right. So if, if, if we've got a family limited partnership in my, in my particular family, the, uh, uh, and uh, if we've got, if you got that in that family and somebody else, you know, wants to come in and buy into something like that, first of all, why would anybody want to do that? Uh, you know, you've got a family controlled business, you know, nobody's going to, nobody in their right mind would buy into anything like that because they're not going to have any control uh, of anything. So, so due to those circumstances, typically you can take a bit of a discount. Now that said, IRS has been kind of, kind of taking a hard look at, at discounts. Uh, at one point in time, you know, 40% 40, 40 discounts were not uncommon. I really uh, discourage anybody from going that far on discounts nowadays, but uh, but that that's more of an individual more of an individual uh, discussion that you, that you have on there. 
Uh, question here on family living partnership, uh, putting assets in a trust to allow tax-free transfers. Well, uh, that that's going to be a completely that's going to be a completely different animal here. The, uh, the the family limited partnership. The goal in mind here is for gifting, and uh, it, the uh, putting assets into a trust. Uh, and I promised earlier that we were going to mention trust, and I might as well get it out of the way right now. Uh, you know, a, a trust is, you know, is a mechanism that's in place where you put assets into it. And literally, by definition, the trust means you're putting it in care of somebody else. I mean, that that's the that that's the legal definition of of a trust. Now, depending on the type of trust that you have, you know, there's there's revocable trust and there's and there's irrevocable trusts. Now it always seemed backwards to me, but but your revocable trusts are where you actually still retain ownership of it, and upon date of death, you get some step up and basis on those on those assets that are in an are in a revocable trust. The irrevocable trust does not get a step up in basis. So uh, the last I checked, right before we did fall tax schools, folks, there's over 50 different kinds of trusts. And, uh, you know, we, we touch on them a little bit in the uh, farm estate transfer uh, workshop that I can certainly get you on the list to, to attend that, that workshop. But uh, those trust, those trust, uh, uh, the trust discussions, I really prefer that those individual discussions, that's probably something you need to sit down with your attorney on because there is so much variety in, in uh, what, what the trusts do. I get calls from tax professionals all the time. Uh, hey, I had a, client, I had a client that died and they have a trust. And the first thing out of my mouth is, well, what kind of trust? And uh, you know they they don't know. Well, they have to. They, that that that's that turns out to be a call to the attorney, and then uh, from there they need to talk to the attorney about all right, what does this type of trust? What does that mean? What does that actually mean in uh, in that regard? Uh, good question here on what's a discount. Uh, the the discount a discount is. Uh, say if you had land that was say we if we had a parcel of land that was worth a million dollars and we had it in a family limited partnership, uh, we could probably discount that. Let's just, let, I'm just gonna throw a number out there. Let's say that uh, your attorney and accountant agree that we can discount that property 20% because of minority ownership and lack of marketability because it's a closely held family business. So when we, when we value that land for the estate, we can value it at eight hundred thousand dollars rather than the million dollars because of of the discounts. And uh, uh, in the past, discounts have been very very aggressive on the uh, on uh, properties. And forty uh, percent was not uncommon. I think forty percent is going to get you audited nowadays. Uh, frankly, I think I think you're probably looking at a, at a smaller number on that. Okay, uh, enough on that. We got. Uh, let's drive on here just just a little bit here. Uh, next, we've got the two different types of corporations, and uh, and I'm going to save the real detail oriented side of this to to until until after lunch. But uh, initially, what you have here is you've got the C corporation. All right, the C corporation, and, and there's and there's all kinds of there's there's many different kinds of corporations. The two corporations we see in the farming application most of the time is going to be the C corporation and the S corporation. So those are the two we're going to talk about here today. The C corporation is kind of a living, breathing animal all of its own. All right, it files its own tax return, it pays its own tax. Now, the only way that you get money out of a C corporation into the hands of the shareholders is either by paying rent, wages, or dividends, All right? So uh, what you have is you've got double taxation going on here because you've got, you've got uh, profit in the C corporation and the C corporation pays tax on any profits. And then the money that flowed through to 
the individual shareholders, they pay tax on their income on their individual returns. So that's, that's where you get the double taxation uh, with, with the C corporation. Now, that said, folks are saying, well, why would you, why on earth would you do that to begin with? Well, the thing you got to realize in, 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 in just about all cases of income flowing to shareholders, that's an expense to the C corporation, except dividends, right? If you pay, if you pay dividends out, dividends are kind of punitive, uh, in that, uh, the corporation, the C corporation doesn't get expense for paying out dividends. All right. But the shareholders have to pay income tax on that when it gets reported on their individual income. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, what I would, what I would ask, you know, the, the, for, for information, the, the folks that are asking about information for the uh, state transfer workshops, I'll have my email address up here a little bit later. What I would suggest is shoot me an email and I can get you in, I can get you in contact with the right folks, uh, on that, uh, for right now, the, uh, C corporation coming back to this, the uh, owner's personal assets are protected. You've got corporate protection. Uh, so personal assets are not available to satisfy business liabilities. All right. That's, that's one of the, one of the you know, major components of the, of the C corporation is you've got liability protection. Now the C corporation in, in tax, in, in terms of tax savings, it does give you more potential for tax deductions to lower tax. Uh, a C corporation can, for instance, some folks have opted to put the personal residence into the C corporation, made it a business asset. So they get depreciation on the house. When you put a roof on the house or siding on the house, it turns out to be a farm expense. Now, the downside of that is there's more expenses to be taken on the front end, but uh, it is super expensive to get that asset out of the corporation sometime in the future. All right. It's it, typically when you form a form any type of corporation, especially a C corporation, putting assets in is uh, not going to be a taxable event, but taking them out is a big time taxable event because here's where the double taxation comes into play. Uh, say, you, say we put a house in there and then we end up having to take the house out sometime in the near future. Uh, when we sell the house, okay, we pay tax on the house and then that sale ends up, uh, when that sale is, uh, is uh, when that income is distributed, it gets uh, the individual shareholders pay tax on that money as well. Now that I'm, I'm speaking in terms of a, of a liquidation type of situation there, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's easy to put assets in there and there's more deductions that you can get just as so long as you never, as you never have to unwind the C corporation. All right. There, there is some tax advantages to, to doing that. S corporation. All right. Now the S corporation is a little different animal. All right, it functions an awful lot like a general partnership. All right, it's a pass-through entity, meaning that the S corporation files its tax return, but the S corporation doesn't pay any tax. All right, if we had an S corporation with two uh, with two equal shareholders, all right, half the money goes to one shareholder, half the money goes to the other shareholder, and they report that income on their individual returns. All right, so the, so an S corporation is not going to pay tax. It it passes all profits on to the shareholders, and the shareholders pay the tax on their individual return. All right, now one of the big advantages that you that you have with the S corporation, uh, and this is a this is a tax side of things. The pass through profits coming through a, through an S corporation are not subject to self employment tax. All right, that's huge. However, if you have an S corporation, you are required, and when I say required, I mean required to pay a salary to shareholders. All right, that is a requirement. 
S corporations that don't pay salaries to shareholders, it's clearly reported on the tax return and, and folks that don't do that, they all get audited. I mean, it's an autom it's, it's an automatic audit. Uh, so, but that's folks, that's where the self-employment tax gets paid in an S corporation, all right? That money flowing through to the, to the shareholders in the way of profit, you don't pay self-employment tax on that, but when they pay the wages to the shareholders, well, there's FICA and Medicare withholding on those wages. And that's where the self-employment tax gets paid in an S corporation. Now, that said, typically you can save some self-employment tax with an S corporation because that salary, there's no real guidance there. there well, there is guidance on what the salary needs to be with an S corporation, but uh, there's no hardcore formula. I mean, I wish there was a formula that, okay, average profits for five years, take that times a percent, and that's what, that's what we need to pay for salary. It's not that simple, all right? But what I can guarantee you is uh, it needs to be a reasonable salary. Uh, if you've got an S corporation that was making a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of profit, and they were only paying $10,000 of uh, salary to shareholders on that, uh, that's probably going to get looked, you know, IRS is going to look at that and say, mm, we're going to take a peek at that one. Uh, so it, you know, it needs to be a reasonable salary. And there, there's some tools that I'll share with you after lunch that, uh, that, that can help out with that. But, but that's, that's an area where you really need to be relying on your tax professional in that, in that regard. The uh, S corporations, you know, like the C corporations, uh, any, any corporate entity, there's a lot of formality to it. You've got to issue stock with either one of these. You have to have bylaws. You have to have annual meetings every year with, uh, with the uh, entity itself. And, and uh, typically you got to have a notebook with your, with your uh, board minutes that are that are in there. I've I've had corporations that have been audited before. The first thing the auditor asks for is the notebook with all the board minutes in there. And because uh, if you don't follow all the rules, you can get your corporate status uh, revoked. So there's liability protection. There is some ability to save some tax, especially with the S corporation. But you've got some fiery hoops that you got to jump through in order to, uh, to maintain that status. All right. So um, just looking here at the, uh, looking here at the list here, a uh, couple things that we want to touch on. And then uh, we actually may be moving, we may be running just a tiny bit ahead, but uh, let's not, let's not get ahead of ourselves too much here. Uh, land ownership with an entity. Uh, let's, let's talk about this just a little bit. Uh, folks, it is never a good idea to put land into a C, into a C corporation. <clears throat> S corporation isn't too bad because they're they're not that hard they're not that hard to unwind. But uh, C corporations are uh, kind of hard to unwind on on that uh, on that regard. The reason why you never want to put land into one of those into a C corporation is down the road. If you ever have to liquidate the C corporations, there's this thing called building gains tax that uh, that's at the corporate level, and uh, C corporations don't have a capital gains rate. It's all ordinary income uh, when uh, when you sell something like that inside of the C corporation. So if uh, I, and I've I've helped some families unwind some of these corporations they were very popular back in the late 70s and uh so there, there were a lot of there were a lot of uh, uh a lot of tax authorities that were really pushing hard to form corporations back in the mid and late 1970s well you do the math here folks the, the folks that set those things up back in the late 70s are starting to get a little bit of age to them and uh you know, if there's not a farming error to continue the uh, corporation, uh, and and they're no longer interested in running the farm, they're pretty much they're pretty much faced with the with the hardcore the hardcore fact that they got to liquidate this thing. So 
you look at land that was contributed back in the 70s versus what the land is valued now, you sell that inside of the corporation, and then that money goes, uh, get, when money gets distributed to the shareholders, it gets taxed on the shareholders return too. It's not hard to get into a you know, combined tax rate over 50%. Uh, when when you do something like that, so uh, you know, I'm not saying that C corporations are completely bad, but you don't ever want to put land into those things. All right, have have the corporation be the operating unit. You may want to have like an LLC that uh, that owns the land and uh, keep the land, but keep the land out of the out of the C corporation. Keep the land out of the C corporation. All right. Uh, the other types of ownership that we that we have here, the uh, typically you can put these things into into tandem, and you can have uh, you know multiple entities. And in fact, multiple entities are they're they're very commonplace. Uh, I I go to a lot of uh, I go to a lot of tax seminars over the course of the year, and uh, some and do a fair amount of teaching too. And uh, when you, when I talk to producers, it's not uncommon. It, it's not just two or three entities nowadays, it's seven or eight. And, uh, and they're just, they're, they're really, uh, sometimes I think they're going a little overboard with uh, the, with the creation of, uh, of these entities and everything. So, uh, you know, you, you want, I think you want to be a little bit careful in forming too many entities, because remember, every entity, every entity that you create, you're going to have to have a separate set of books, and it's going to have to file its own tax return. So, you know, it's going to magnify your, your accounting costs in, uh, in, uh, in getting that pulled off. Now, succession plans. All right. There's multiple strategies involved with that. Now, one one thing that I really uh, really push uh, is uh, you know if the corporate structure S corp or C corporation, both of those entities are going to be issuing stock, and uh, ownership is determined by stock. Well, transferring stock uh, is is uh, in in many many consider easier. Uh, you know, at least a, a, a potentially easier method of uh, passing on assets uh, because corporations continue even with the death of a shareholder. So, uh, you know, it, it, it moves on. Now, you still can have some estate tax issues because the, the, uh, the uh, stock is going to be worth a certain market value and we still have that total, uh, that total price of the uh, a state out there that we have to that we have to take take ownership of. Uh, it's not uncommon for the farmland to be held outside of the entity. In other words, uh, you might have like a C corporation, and the land is held outside of the C corporation privately. Now that still leaves it kind of open to to the liability concerns, but. Uh, but uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, putting that land in a separate entity be besides the operating entity in that in that regard. Uh, we don't uh, you know we, we, we really don't explore the multitude of all these other ownership options. Uh, you know we, we could we could get get going for an hour, I think on this if we if we wanted to. the 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 only cautionary note that I make on this is that, uh, uh, when when folks are forming multiple entities, the the main concern that I have is uh, are all the operating entities farms, because uh, you know, well case in case in point, this was a this was a court case from uh, uh, oh, a few years back. It was actually a feedlot in Colorado, and what they did is they split off the uh, the feed mill. Uh, as a separate entity. Well, it turns out the feed mill uh, does not meet the IRS definition of a farm because the feed mill isn't producing anything. All right, it's, it's, it's milling grain. So uh, in, in doing that, that, uh, you know, everything was a, considered a farm, thus subject to the, to the farm taxation rules, but then the feed mill was, 
was a different animal and they had to they, they ended up having to do estimated tax payments for the uh for the feed mill which is uh, which is something that you you need to consider as well okay one of the last things we want to talk about before we get into our case studies we want to talk a little bit about the minnesota corporate farming law and i know that we have some out-of-state folks that are on here today and just just bear with me this doesn't take long to talk about but uh, back in the 70s uh, Minnesota implemented a, uh, a corporate farming law in uh, in the state and it affects corporations limited partnerships limited liability companies and irrevocable trusts all right and that means essentially that those items cannot be engaged in farming uh, if you have those particular entities. Now, the exceptions to that, and that, and here's where everybody start, you know, first of all, everybody has that shock, shock look on their face. But uh, there, the exceptions are if you have, you know, essentially, if you have a family operation going on, where it's where it's, it's literally a family operation. That's one way that we get around the, uh, the corporate farming law. So you can run a farm as a corporation, as a limited partnership, as a limited liability company, but it has to be a closely held farm, uh, a closely held family unit. Now, a couple things on this. There's a couple things that uh, uh, that, that is limited on there. Your, your entities, let me back, back up here a moment. Uh, if you have one of these entities, uh, you, you are limited to putting 1500 acres into any given entity and operating it as a farm. So, so you can't, if you got, say, if your farm has 3000 acres, you can't dump 3000 acres into the LLC. That's going to be in violation of the Minnesota corporate farming law. But, uh, you know, you're limited to 1500 acres and that's by Minnesota statute in that regard. Now, most families using a business structure are gonna meet those requirements to farm and own ag land, but, but it's gotta be a family unit in, in order for that to happen. Uh, this uh, has to be reported Minnesota Department of Agriculture. It's a $15 fee every year to, to report that. It's not really a big deal, but, uh, but, but it does have to be reported every year. But, uh, you know, so as long as you've got a family operation, you can, uh, you know, you can get around the Minnesota corporate farming law, you, uh, but, but you do have that 1,500 acre limit. Uh, that's, uh, and that, that's regardless of whether it's a farming unit or not. Okay, and that's got to be registered with the Secretary of State. Uh, and this is uh, separate from the Minnesota Department of Ag. So there's actually, for corporate farming, there's actually two things that you got to file, you got to file one, one form with Minnesota Secretary of State, you got to file another one with Minnesota Department of Ag. All right, and that's an and that's an annual that's an annual reporting mechanism. And let's see, that's more or less what we already talked about. Okay, um, look here at the. Let me glance over at the at the chat here. Uh, any, I guess I'll open this thing up. Any questions before I gravitate us into that uh, that case study? I think we'll be in we'll be in good shape on that. Okay, seeing nothing coming through. What we want to do is we want to we want to put uh, I want to put this what we've talked about into practice. And one of the sheets that I that I sent out, uh, and if and if you printed it fine, if you if you didn't print it, uh, the, it's it's going to work okay. But it's the uh, <laughs> it's the it's the one that it's the one that starts off uh, listing your uh, listing your different uh, considerations for uh, for uh, selecting an entity. What we've got is I'm going to give you a set of circumstances, and and where where I'm going with this is, uh, I, I, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think when you're making a decision like like a business entity, it's really no different 
than the process you go through when you're starting to initiate a farm estate transfer plan. And, and let, let me chase this rabbit hole for just a moment. The, when, when, you, when you're starting to work on the farm estate transfer plan, it's, it's very important to know and understand what the goals and objectives of the exiting generation is as well as the entering generation. It's very important for there to be some discussion as far as is there a farming heir that's going to be taking over the farm eventually, All right? That needs to be determined. You need to have a roadmap of here's where we want the farm to go before you go visit the accountant and the attorney and they start charging you $100, $200, $300 an hour for, uh, for a consultation. And it just stands to make sense. I mean, get, you know, have a clear roadmap of, you know, where, where you're going with the farm estate transfer process. Then you sit down with the attorney and the accountant. And if you can, if you can clearly indicate this is what we want to have happen, they can come up with, uh, they can come up with those, those items, uh, in, in, no, in no problem, no, you come up with it in short order. It's no different than if you're talking about uh, the, you know, business entity. It's, uh, you know, what are your leading concerns, all right, about the farming operation? And what are our goals? What are our, what are our objectives in this regard? Oftentimes, if you walk into the attorney and the accountant, and you have that clearly defined, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, much, much easier. All right. Question came up here uh, uh, from uh, Ann here. Can you talk about Minnesota law change, about Minnesota law changes to ag homestead and how it impacts family partnerships? Um, not, and I'm not really prepared to talk about that. Uh, our, uh, one of our other uh, educators uh, that, uh, that, uh, Work, worked with us uh, some time ago was kind of our expert on that. The, uh, as far as homestead goes, uh, you know, I can, well, what I would recommend is uh, shoot me an email and I can direct you some, to some resources. Uh, I'd have to refresh myself a little bit on that. We, uh, we, we, talk, we typically teach that in our farm estate transfer workshop, but I honestly haven't touched that stuff for probably six months. Uh, let's move over to the case study in this in this regard. Uh, case study. Uh, what we have in this in this case study is we've got a brother and sister with separate farms, but they're also farming a little bit together, and meaning that they don't have any kind of a formal partnership. You know what's theirs is theirs, and they're they're you know we're assuming that they're probably sharing some equipment, they're sharing some labor. And uh, they're, they're, but they're still reporting their own income on their own returns. Now, uh, the brother has uh, 1,100 acres and currently has a income of 166,000. So, you know, there's there's profit. There's 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 clear profit in this uh, in the brother's operation. Uh, the sister has a uh, thousand acres and she's got $150,000 worth of, uh, of income on, uh, on her return. And she also has a son uh, that has a small uh, hog facility and he's got uh, $16,000 worth of net income uh, that, uh, that they're sitting with. So what we're interested in is, uh, you know, somehow uh, putting these, putting these three together and uh, you know, if they want to farm all together, uh, you know, we want to, we want to think a little bit about it. I mean, is this, is this best to be handled individually in a partnership or in a corporate, uh, type of entity? Now, what I, what I'd like to do though, for this first discussion, uh, and, uh, the, the papers that you have there for those that have, that have printed that off the, um, for this discussion one, we've got the brother, sister and the, and the sister's son. Uh, we want to come up with a, an entity 
that they could work with, their number one priority is saving taxes, right? Number one priority is saving taxes. Number two priority is liability protection. And number three, they don't mind dealing with some extra record keeping and structure. All right, so those are the three things for discussion number one. Taxes is number one, liability is number two. They don't mind dealing with, a, with some extra record keeping for, for, that, uh, for that third priority. Now, I want you to think about that one for, for a, uh, well, once I cut you loose here, flip side of that page is discussion number two, all right, where we have, um, where we have uh, the, the, the priorities in discussion number two is liability protection, the ability to pool assets, and third, the family wants to do something simple. All right, so in that, in that second scenario, liability protection, ability to pool assets, they want something simple. Now, what I'd like you to do, want to take about, uh, I want to take about five minutes, maybe let you, let you kind of uh, ponder this a little bit uh, amongst yourselves. Uh, th this is where discussion in a live session would be would be advantageous. But uh, what I'd like you to do: think about what you think a business entity would work for for discussion one, discussion two. Give you I'll give you about five minutes of uh, quiet time here, and then we'll come back and I'll ask people to to share their thoughts in the, in the chat. And we'll talk about both of these discussion points. All right. So, uh, and any questions, just fire them off into the chat, but I'll, I'll give you, I guess I've got uh, 1141 on the, on the clock, 1142, I guess on the clock. Now uh, let's get, let's go till about, uh, yeah, let's go till, let's go till 47 and, uh, and then I'll bring everybody back in here. So think, think about that for a couple of minutes and uh, we'll bring everybody back here shortly.
All right, folks, let's gather back here again. So let's let's look at this, and uh, I understand that can be a little awkward in a in a in a webinar type of setting. But uh, in the chat, uh, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna share where where answers are coming from with everybody or anything like that. But uh, we want to be fairly informal. But uh, discussion one, okay, their number one priority is saving income taxes. Uh, liability and they don't mind some extra record keeping or structure what uh, you know what what entity or entities might uh, work out okay for these folks any thoughts Okay, I've got uh, C Corporation coming up is one of them. Any other thoughts? Okay, we got an F Family Limited Partnership coming up as uh, okay, an LLP, Limited Liability Company. Just give everybody a couple more seconds here. LLC, LLP. Okay, let's uh, let's 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 talk. Let's let's decode that a little bit. Uh, on uh, on the C corporation side of things, you know, we we did talk we did talk about that. Uh, and, and incidentally, I've got I've got uh, another another response here. S corporation. We, we talked about the C and the S corporation in that there were some tax advantages to that. With, with the C corporation, there's, uh, you know, commonly thought of personal assets that can be put into the corporation as business assets and, and uh, you get deductions for that. So that, that's going to result in, in some tax savings on the, on the C corporation side of things. Now, Bear in mind, you know, we'll, we'll get more into the unwinding part of this, uh, you know, after after we get done e eating lunch. The the other entity that's going to have significant tax savings is going to be the S corporation because of the no self employment tax being paid out from the distributions. But, uh, you know, you have to pay the salary, but typically the salary is going to be less than the profits. So there, there is some tax savings to be had out of the S corporation. So the, the, the two that I'm thinking of in regards to this is there's the, the, the two that are going to have tax savings potential is going to be the C and the S corporation with, with any of the, with any of the limited liability uh, partnerships, you know, with, with the FLP, the LLC, with any of that, the earnings that are coming through are still going to be uh, subject to self-employment tax. They, in, in other words, they essentially get taxed exactly the same way that the sole proprietorship is getting, is getting taxed. So there's, there's really no tax savings that's coming from any of the limited from any of the limited uh, uh, partnerships, you know, especially the LLCs or anything along those lines, with the, the potential, the potential. Uh, now that now that somebody mentioned this in the uh, in in the limited partnership where you've got the general and the limited partners, now there is potential there to where those limited partners are not going to have to pay self-employment tax because it's investment income. So there, there could be an argument on that, but, uh, but that's going to be more of a corporate, as it was labeled earlier in the program, that's going to be more of a corporate farming type of, uh, type of scenario. Uh, the, uh, and the comp, the comment here, uh, yeah, the, the 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 tax savings actually occurs with the with the C and the S corporation. Uh, you know, so there there is tax savings to be to be had with the, with a, with either one of those. Uh, you know, the cautionary note is is that uh, 
the uh, you know the C corporation, we need to be careful because once you set that up, you know, unwinding that thing is a little is a little little tougher than uh, than the others. Let's let's move on to number two here. Uh, the discussion number two, uh, where you know the number one. Oh, and, and sorry, I forgot to address the other deal. The other deal, you know, the uh, you know the corporations, of course, are going to have the liability protection. And uh, you know, if the family doesn't mind dealing with that extra record keeping or structure, well, that kind of that kind of plays right into the C and the S corporation because there is going to be more red tape and there's going to be more stuff to do with. Uh, with uh, the corporations. Number two, we've got uh, priority number one is liability protection, ability to pool assets, and you want to do something simple. All right, so we're wanting to do something simple. Taxes are off the table here uh, for this particular one. Liability protection, pool assets when they want to do something simple. Uh, so what's the, uh, I'm seeing LLC, Other thoughts, LLC. And, the, and there, there is thought here to do the LLP to uh, protect, protect the assets between brothers and sisters or the partners. Uh, and that I certainly, certainly can, uh, can, can certainly agree with that. The, uh, and the LLP structure is essentially the same as the LLC. Frankly, when, when we, uh, when we put, when we put the problem together, we were, we were really thinking LLC, but LLP seems to be, seems to be also coming up, uh, as a, uh, as a potential option here. And, uh, and a lot of that, I think a lot of that just depends on, you know, your personal structure and uh, possibly the type of interaction that you're having with your partners. Uh, you know, if, if you've got that concern of protecting yourself from something that your partner does, that's something that you, that you need to share with, uh, you know, share with the attorney when you sit down and form one of these things. But I think, I think the LLP in that regard is, you know, a, a, a good choice. I mean, LLC, LLP, those are, those are the two where I tend to gravitate towards in this particular discussion. All right. Well, very good. Well, that, that actually was uh, less clunky than I, than I thought it was going to be. Uh, this, uh, folks, this actually ends uh, what we intended on doing for the morning program. Uh, what we are going to do, we're, we're running five minutes ahead, uh, which, uh, uh, is, is pretty, pretty darn close. Uh, we are going to break for 45 minutes. Uh, now you don't, please, please don't, uh, don't log out of the webinar. Uh, just leave, uh, you know, what I would do is I'd shut your camera off and, and mute yourself. And, uh, uh, I'll, you don't even have options for that. I'm going to shut the camera off, but what we'll do is we will reconvene at, uh, 1240. I'll put that in the chat. We'll uh, we'll allow everybody forty five minutes to uh, uh, do whatever they're going to do. I'll, me, me personally, it's going to be leftovers, and uh, but I'm not going to share that uh, on camera or anything along those lines. But uh, we'll come back at uh, we'll reconvene at twelve forty with part number two, and uh, folks, folks, enjoy your lunch, and we will uh, see you at twelve forty. Thank you.
All right, everybody. Well, welcome back. Hope everybody enjoyed their their lunch. In the era of uh, pandemic and webinars and everything, this is not an uncommon thing. But uh, good, good to have everybody back. Now, my challenge is to keep everybody awake now with a with a full stomach. So. What we've done is uh, we we more or less before lunch we recap the case study in the in our uh, in our live sessions. What we typically do is we assign that over the over the lunch hour, and then it uh, turns into discussion uh, while everybody eats, and then we we come back and do that discussion afterwards. Well, that that we've already done, so let's uh, basically uh, move back into. Uh, our uh, our business entities what what we want to do this afternoon is uh, uh we're we're going to go through the same entities that we talked about this morning but it's going to be a little more of a deep dive uh we want to uh talk about characteristics how you form these entities uh how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis uh taxation on a little deeper level and uh, also weave in uh, corporate farming law a little bit uh, on that as well. So uh, Nathan, I see you're there. Uh, I am going to uh, stop the share here and let you share that. And I'll let, uh, let Nathan take it away for, uh, for a little bit here this afternoon. Can everyone hear me better or is it? still echoey it it's a little echoey but uh i mean i can hear you but but it it sounds like you're it sounds like you're in a maybe in an echo chamber well i'll try it if it gets kind of bad rob you might have to take over for me i've done webinars in this exact same room before and it hasn't been an issue previously well, I can tell you're you're sitting a little closer to it than what you were earlier this morning, so that that may take care of the problem. All right, so I'll go ahead and, and start this. If we get some comments, I might have to kind of bow out and rob you speak a little more clearly. So sorry about that, folks. But with that, we'll try to start up again here with going into more specifically on sole proprietorships. Okay, so again, this is. Typically what, typically what most people kind of start out with. I mean, this is the, the easiest to start with. And even typically, if you have an LLC or an S corporation, you probably started as a sole proprietorship in the early stages of your, your business. So this should uh, um, be uh, familiar with most folks. So again, you know, the ease of it, right? It's a little easier to create and to manage. There is not that corporate veil that we've alluded to earlier this morning. You know, the personal assets, they are not protected from the business liability. So there is no liability protection that we talked about um, that is a bonus of some of those other business structures. Right, we had that bullet point about the unlimited liability, um, but uh, keep that in mind that it is it is somewhat true. Again, easy to go into and out of business. It's easy to set this up. It's not painstaking to dissolve the sole proprietorship in comparison with some of the old other corporations. You know, the profits you keep them right. All they they just uh, pass through onto your individual tax return. Record keeping, again, going to be a little bit easier, right? Not quite as complicated as some of the other business structures that we'll talk to uh, later today. So again, the formation, start your business, you know, start this uh, operation. And we're going to talk about this several times today about having this separate business checking account and how that's important. You know, it isn't required in a sole proprietorship to have this separate business and personal checking account, but we do highly recommend it. It makes record keeping easier. 
your accountant is going to like it as well. So keep that in mind as we go through these other entities. And with the formation here, you might have to obtain some required licensing and permits. You know, in a livestock industry, there might be some you know animal units that you can have on your on your site. You know, you can have you know up to a hundred, up to a thousand, right? There's different animal permits are required. And then, you know, proper tax forms with the IRS, right? You know, this is probably going to be Schedule F in the farming business on your 1040. Okay, and we have this, the last bullet point about the tax ID number. So in, if you have this uh, sole proprietorship and you have no employees, your tax ID number can be your social security number, which isn't a big deal, but potentially you don't want to throw your social security number out on all the 1099s that you're maybe filling out. Um, <clears throat> getting the tax ID number is pretty quick. You know, I know Rob's mentioned it's only, you know, less than 10 minutes to fill out the form and it'll spit out a number that you can associate with your business for tax purposes. So just keep that in mind. Again, we'll have this, you know, formal agreement. There's nothing very formal required with the sole proprietorship. As we go a little bit later this afternoon, there's a little more formalities required. Um, and then the taxation here, it's going to be the simplest. Earnings are subject to self-employment tax. Um, and here's just kind of a graphic of what that's going to look like. So we have the sole proprietor, right? Uh, they're going to report their business income on his or her personal tax return. So again, Schedule F with farming, Schedule C with some other non-farming business on their 1040s. Hopefully this kind of makes sense. You know, that's kind of that, um, again, kind of that, uh, that's how it's gonna work. So with that, we're gonna move on to the next one, which is a qualified joint venture. So what this is, is pretty much, a sole proprietorship that's shared between husband and wife. So you have uh, two spouses, you know, if they're both materially participating in the farm or other business, they can do this qualified joint venture, right? We have the bullet point there. You know, we can't be doing this with a partnership or an LLC. Both spouses will be paying that self-employment tax. And as Rob mentioned this morning, that can be a benefit. You know, sometimes, you know, if the husband gets most of the uh, income in his name, the wife doesn't always have much, and this can be vice versa as well, but the one spouse may not have much social security paid in or their quarters up kept. So with this qualified joint venture, you have both spouses paying in. We can see that's revocable only with the IRS consent. And just continuing on here, so we will be filling out or those doing the qualified joint venture, it's a 1065, which is the partnership return. The election becomes invalid when a condition is broken. So if you do get divorced, let's say, well, the condition is gonna be broken for this qualified joint venture. Okay, and then you can elect this again when all the conditions are met, right? Um, So to do this again, you know, both spouses need to elect that qualified joint venture treatment. So again, it's pretty much a two person sole proprietorship. So there are no tax savings with this uh, entity or with this structure. So if that's your biggest goal, this might not be the way to go with that. So again, income expenses, they're gonna be split based on interest in the venture. Typically with the qualified joint venture, it's a 50-50 split with a husband and wife. So the two spouses are typically, you know, 50-50. Um, again, we have that, you know, if this is an LLC, this is not going to work. And again, each spouse will file their separate Schedule F or, or Schedule C, whatever it's going to be. Okay. You can maintain one set of books. So for record keeping needs, you can do one set of books, split, uh, split it at the end of the year, you know, to income expenses for the two separate spouses. So again, taxation treatment, 
identical to the sole proprietorship. So if we saw that previous box there with the sole proprietorship and this transfers to the individual tax return via Schedule F, that's what qualified joint venture would look like. This split two separate ways. So here's a rule that is out there. There's this check the box election where an unincorporated entity can change its tax status without changing its non-tax business form. So if you want to be, you know, taxed differently, it, it is a possibility. Um, this gets a little bit messy. Um, Rob might mention a thing or two a little bit later on it as well. Um, you can see that the entity must be C corporation unless it has the valid S uh, election there. And then the election is on that form 8832. And here's this kind of a, a, a table here with the different entity levels and then their federal tax default and then an option. They can elect into uh, something or another. So with the sole proprietorship, right? You can't be uh, the C or S corporation. Um, LLC, right? That's gonna be under a partnership and they can be taxed either as a C or an S corporation. Some of these other partnerships, uh, the general partnership, limited partnership, right? Their default is a partnership, but they can elect to do either the C or the S. So just keep that in mind as we are moving forward. The SM LLC, that's a single member limited liability. Um, so keep that in mind. So with that, we're going to go to the next structure here of a partnership. So a general partnership we're going to start out with here. So again, easier to create and manage. Again, um, personal assets are not protected from that uh, business liability that we've talked about um, right away. So not that liability protection with a general partnership. And that can be kind of magnified with the partnership you know, if one, you know, if we read that bottom bullet point, you know, if the business is sued, you know, there's some form of liability concern. If you, let's just say there's two members in this partnership, if one of you has significantly higher personal assets than the other partner in your partnership, you're particularly at risk because you don't have that personal liability protection and you just have more assets than the other in the partnership. So just bear that in mind, if that's kind of a concern, we need to discuss that, right? You might want to look at maybe a different business entity or just some form of, of we need to address that before we go down this path. So again, the individual partners have joint authority and joint liability. So again, if you have a lot more assets, it might be a little bit of a larger concern. So again, we have this partnership formation here. Again, we highly recommend that separate business checking account, right? For record keeping ease, it's going to make it a lot easier to break down, you know, for your record keeping, business expenses versus personal expenses. And then we have it, again, recommend for this partnership agreement. It's not required, but we do recommend it. And what is that? So we'll get into it right here. So what do we need to address before we go in partnership or before we form this partnership with someone else? First off, you know, what's the name of these partners? Who's all involved? What's the purpose? You know, what, what are we doing as a partnership? Is this a, a farming entity? Is it a dairy farm, crop farm? Or is it going to be, you know, some non-farm business, um, a manufacturing of some sort, right? So what are, what are we doing? Contributions, right? Who in the partnership, what are they putting into to become a partner? Are they putting up cash? Are they putting up land? Are they putting up machinery, livestock? You know, what are they contributing to become a partner? What about profits and losses? You know, how are we splitting the partnership's profits, right? The whole idea here is to, you know, make money with this business. So how do we distribute that? If it's two people, is it a 50-50 split, 60-40 split? You know, how are we breaking this up? 
if we have three people, again, is it a, you know, one third, one third, one third, or there's one partner getting more than the other? And that might correspond to their contributions. Next one there, management powers and duties, right? Who is in charge, right? If you have two members of this partnership, and I'll use a dairy farm as an example, is one in charge of the dairy, the other's in charge of the crops, you know, what are their duties? What are their powers? Who gets the final say, right? Like who is the, if we think of kind of those larger corporations, who's the CEO, who's the CFO, right? We can throw out all these different terminologies, but who really is in charge? Who gets the final decision? And then amendments. You know, what about if we start a partnership here in March of 22, and then two, three, four, five years down the road, we want to change something. What is the process? You know, how do we initiate a change in our partnership agreement? You know, talking about that, you know, up front when we set up this structure is going to be easier than five years down the road. We say, hey, I want to add my son. What are we going to do? Okay, which goes along with our next bullet point there. New partners. How do we bring in new people? Right, let's just say that... Um, my other, our other brother wants to join his partnership. What does he need to contribute? What's the, is he going to contribute? How much of the profits and losses is he going to share in? You know, what is the breakdown? And potentially maybe um, how do we transfer one of the partner's interests? Let's just say that you have two brothers. The one son wants to get in on the partnership. Can the, you know, father transfer shares to his son or daughter or someone else to join the partnership? What about a buy-sell agreement where we say, you know, five years down the road, you know, you have to buy this or first right to refusal or, or different things like that that go into the partnership, okay? Continuity of this partnership, right? We want this continue potentially beyond our lifetime. How do we make that happen? And then the last two bullet points there, mediation, arbitration, you know, what happens when we have an issue, potentially financially, right, this disillusion, how do we break up this partnership? If we potentially, the, you know, maybe it's just we're done. We're selling the farmland, we're selling the cows, the equipment, we're done. How do we go about doing that? How do we break out the sale of those assets? Or, you know, what is, what is our next steps? So these are all different things that need to be considered when joining in to this uh, partnership. And this isn't unique to a partnership. If we're doing even a, 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 the joint venture, maybe that's a good thing just to talk about, right? Is it a 50-50 split with a qualified joint venture? What about an LLC or the S corporation? All of these bullet points need to be discussed as well. Um, Rob will share a story uh, in a little bit here about how a partnership agreement that was already in place really helped save the farm. And I'll share, I'll save that for him. Okay, operation of the business should occur out of the business checking account. We've kind of highlighted that point all morning, all day. So profits here, so they can be shared through draws, guaranteed payments to the partners. Okay, so the distributions from a partnership are not taxable to the partner, but they're gonna reduce each respective partner's capital account. So there's gonna be more record keeping involved with the partnership in comparison with the sole proprietorship, right? We need to keep track of this capital account. How much do each partner have into the business? Okay, so the distributions and excess of earnings are taxable when that partnership terminates. Okay, so again, the, the guaranteed payment um, to a partner is treated as an expense to the partnership and is reported as income to the partner on their K-1. We have a graphic here in the next slide that hopefully highlights that. So it's clear for everyone. So again, as I just mentioned, more record keeping is going to be required with the uh, partnership. There's a few more things that we need to track in comparison to the previous entities. Therefore, our accounting fees might be a little higher. 
So keep that in mind. If that's an issue, well, we need to address that. And again, here is this graphic of what our uh, taxes are going to look like here with the partnership. So again, we see the partnership, and again, the the share their partner's individual share of profits and losses passes through to their individual returns via a K-1. So no income tax is paid at the partnership level. All business income is subject to self-employment tax. Okay, so kind, kind of similar to the previous ones. Um, and uh, that's how taxes work. So with that, actually, uh, Rob's going to jump ahead and continue this. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Rob will wrap up uh, the next hour or so of this program. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate that. The uh, uh, and, and certainly and Nathan did a wonderful job with that. There's just a couple things I'm going to back up and and uh, especially for the group today and for the recorded version, I want to make sure that we drive a, a couple of points home on this, uh, folks. So, so I'm, 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 I'm scheduled to go with limited liability, but let's back up and talk, talk partnerships here. Just, just a little bit, if I can back up a few, back up a few slides on the, on the bookkeeping side of things. Uh, it, Here's probably one of the more important things that I'm going to mention, and and this isn't just for partnerships; it's for any any formalized entity. But but specifically, let me let me address this from the partnership standpoint. All right, a partnership return is uh, filed on a form 1065. If uh, the if the uh, owners have more than $250,000 worth of assets. And in today's day and times, that's not very much. Uh, the partnership is required to file a balance sheet with the tax return. And what that means is that uh, there's, there's a reconciliation page on the 1040, on the 1065. And more or less, you have to account for every single penny that went through the business checking account over the course of the year. And, and you have to have that in order to, to uh, fill out the balance sheet. Now, when, when it's suggested that, uh, that you have a separate bank account for the partnership, when you have to fill out one of these balance sheets, folks, in, in my opinion, it's not optional, it's a, it's a requirement. I mean, when you get into a partnership or you get into an LLC or any of these formal entities, it's keep the books separate for the business account versus the personal account. Because when, when, if, you're, if your accountant has to put together this balance sheet, they don't want to have to sift through all the grocery bills and the trips to Walmart and the trips to Target and, and all that. Uh, in order to to uh, arrive at at uh, the numbers that actually go on the return. Additionally to that, I've I've had partnerships and corporations that were audited. If uh, if your books match up with every penny that went through your business bank account, that's that's most of what IRS initially looks for in an audit. Is they're they're looking for leakage. And everything. If if you if you've accounted for everything and it all and it all reconciles with the bank statements, and 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 that that said along those lines, that's another practice to get into is is keep a business checking account, reconcile your bank statements, any of this new uh, newer software, uh, anything from Quicken to QuickBooks to you know there's farm specific programs out there. They all do a real good job of reconciling against the bank statement, and that's one of the best things you can do to ensure accuracy of your books. So, uh, so that that's that's the first soapbox thing that I wanted to talk about. Now, the the other thing that uh, that I want to uh, uh, address here is uh, 
the uh, distributions, how you get money out of a, uh, how you get money out of the uh, partnership account. Now, uh, typically, far, typically, uh, people in the partnership take a draw. The draw isn't actually taxable. It's it's based off of that K one that comes out of the partnership. But uh, there's also this thing called a capital account. Nathan mentioned this a little bit ago. Capital account is more or less your equity in the business. And when you have to fill out that balance sheet on the 1065, uh, it, 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 the capital account becomes an asset listed on the balance sheet. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's possible, the way you increase your, your capital account is you make money and you don't take it all out of the partnership. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the simplest ways to, to increase those capital accounts. You can have a negative capital account uh, and a negative capital account when you, when you uh, end the partnership becomes taxable income because essentially you've been living on borrowed money uh, if that's the case. Now, capital accounts are important. Uh, folks, there, there's also this term called basis. All right, and I'm sure everybody's probably heard of basis before. It's the it, it's essentially the the amount of money that you have uh, uh, the 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 amount of uh, uh, it's not equity, but it's the amount the amount of basis that you have in an asset is uh, what can be taken as an expense uh, in in the event of a sale. Uh, say, for instance, I bought. Uh, let's say I buy a new $100,000 tractor, all right? And uh, at the time that I buy the tractor, I've got $100,000 worth of basis. If I, if I take uh, fast depreciation on that tractor, say I depreciate uh, $50,000 off the tractor in that first year, well, I've got $50,000 of basis remaining in it. That's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the amount of money that I spend on it that hasn't been expensed. Uh, you, you have to have basis in a pass-through entity, meaning a partnership, an LLC, an S corporation, any of these pass-through entities, you have to have, the partners have to have basis if you take a loss, all right? If you don't have basis to absorb a loss in a given year, the loss gets suspended. And that's one thing that you, on the tax side of things, that you need to know is, is uh, you have to have basis. Now, all this sounds fine and dandy, but uh, what, what, I, what I want you to get, get the idea, the, the idea that I want to communicate here is that whether you're doing a partnership, an LLC, some type of limited partnership, or an S or a C Corp, you're probably looking at spending more money on the accounting side of things to get everything filed and get it done. All right, anybody that, anybody that thinks otherwise, I wanna correct that immediately because uh, there, there is more bookkeeping, with, even with the general partnership, there's more bookkeeping involved. All right, so what, what I don't, don't wanna beat that too much, too much to death. But uh, you know what I what I do want to do uh, is uh, is look at this. So let's uh, okay. I've got a, got a question here, and this is probably relevant to what I was talking about. If no distributions are taken out of the partnership, then is there no income tax paid? The answer to that is uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it does not matter. Uh, let's back up to this graph. Okay, this graph here is going to explain the, the question from Chase. Okay, the partnership files its return. All right, let's say for instance that the partnership made zero money. All right, zero money divided by three partners equally is gonna be zero money going to all three partners. That's the amount of tax that, uh, that that's how the tax gets figured. It's based off profits. You can make zero money in the partnership. In the part, you know, the partnership can file a, a return with zero money on it, but and there's going to be no tax paid on that. But the partnership might distribute draws to all the partners, even though the partnership made no profits. All right, that's going to be a tax-free distribution, but it results in a negative capital account. 
And upon, upon uh, ending the partnership, negative capital accounts become taxable income. All right, so hopefully that, hopefully that explains that. And, and Chase, if, if it didn't, you know, shoot me an email on that or we can, we can talk on that. Okay, let's go to LLCs in this case, uh, limited liability companies, a uh, little, little deeper on this. Now, the default taxation, the, the default taxation for an LLC is a partnership. Most, most LLCs file on a partnership 1065 tax return. The only way that you know that it's an LLC is on the name it says, Smith Farms, comma, LLC. That's the only way that you'd know it's an LLC from looking at the tax return. Uh, you can have a single member LLC. Uh, say, you know, one person by themselves can form an LLC. They file it on an individual tax return and uh, it's, it's, it's considered a disregarded entity. You still have to register it with the Secretary of State. But uh, but you still get LLC status, and uh, so so if you have that single member, they're either going to file on a Schedule F it's a, if it's a farm, or they'll file it on a Schedule C if it's a non-farm business. Now, the uh, I mentioned this before lunch. This is a popular choice because you get the liability protection of the LLC but you don't have all the corporate fiery hoops that you have to jump through. It's simple. All right. And that's one of the biggest reasons why uh, this is a very, very popular choice. However, a couple things to also consider. We talked a little bit about uh, farm program payment limits. All right. LLCs are limited to one $125,000 limit for, for farm program payments at, at, the current, at the current level. So uh, for that reason alone, I know of several operations that opted to go with the general partnership because there might be three partners and each individual partner gets $125,000 limitation for, for FSA program payments. All right. So with, with general partnership, with qualified joint venture, with uh, uh, any, anything that's non-formalized entity, there it's, it's a per person limit on the, on the farm program payments with, uh, with, regards to, uh, with regards to the limits. Once you get into the LLCs, the LLPs, any of the, any of the, L, any of the limited partnerships or an S corp or a C corp, then it's one per one for the whole entity. Okay. Um, formation. All right. First of all, uh, you know, as far as your LLC goes, uh, you got to register that with the Secretary of State. There is an annual filing. There's an annual form that you got to file with the Secretary of State every year. That's that's kind of a minor formality. Uh, the, I highly recommend uh, that LLC members should uh, put together an LLC operating agreement. It's going to be the same thing as a partnership agreement, except it's for an LLC. Uh, but it, but it, it addresses essentially the same exact thing. Uh, previously, uh, in a, in a pre previous uh, firm that I worked with, I had, uh, I had a situation where uh, it was a, it was a, partnership made up of several brothers and uh fortunately there was a partnership agreement that was in place one of the brothers contracted terminal brain cancer uh which was a tragedy uh but he uh that brother ended up passing away the the part where the reason why i tell this is that uh the partnership agreement that that, that these folks had addressed these contingency type of things going on uh, how the surviving spouse of the deceased brother was going to be treated and bought out of the operation, how she was going to be treated financially was all addressed in the partnership agreement. There was really no jockeying that had to happen with that. And, uh, and, and folks, I, I don't want to sound a downer on this, but bad stuff can happen. I mean, it, uh, you know, illness, 
uh, death and things, things do happen. So it's, it's a real good idea to have that agreement drawn up. In the case of an LLC, it would be an LLC operating arrangement. In a partnership, it'd be a partnership agreement. All right. So, but it defines rights, responsibilities, and relationships. As far as the operation goes, uh, you definitely want to have a separate bank account. It's not required, but like what I said on the general partnership, this LLC is going to have to file a balance sheet if the assets are over $250,000 and you don't want to be pulling stuff from 14 different locations. Have run everything through one bank account. Your, your accountant will love you for it. The uh, day-to-day operations uh, are going to be similar to a partnership uh, just because that's, that's what it essentially emulates unless you're a single member LLC where it's going to, it's going to emulate a sole proprietor. The, uh, and that, that more or less is how that works. Now, as far as taxation goes, uh, the default for a 1065 is a, uh, is the default is to file a LLC as a partnership return. It gets filed on a 1065 and, uh, it's, everything is going to go through on a, on a schedule K1. The, uh, profit percentages are generally determined in the operating agreement. Uh, usually it's commensurate with the amount of investment that each partner has put into place, but it's something that you can put in your operating agreement. And uh, you do have some, you know, in a, in a general partnership and in an LLC, you do have some latitude as far as uh, uh, making uh, uh, distributions. Uh, you can, you, there can, there can be some elections to, you know, if somebody needs more money in a given year because they did more work or something like that, we've got the ability to do that in a general partnership and in a limited, in a limited liability company. Now in a farming operation where, the, where we're actually producing something, uh, these earnings are all going to be subject to self-employment tax. The taxation is going to be identical to what you get out of the general partnership. The difference is that the general partnership is not going to have the liability protection, the limited liability, the limited liability company is. Now, the uh, a word on uh, this this uh, LLCs can elect to be taxed as a corporation. Nathan alluded to earlier the check the box option. Now, with any entity, all right. Uh, so well, sole proprietor is kind of a kind of a slam dunk there. But uh, but but if you're uh, if you're operating a general partnership or an LLC, and uh, just just for instance, and you wanted to be taxed as a corporation, uh, that's that's what the check the box option is. It's a it's literally a form, and you check the box on this thing. So if if you had an LLC, you could you could do the check the box option. You could turn this thing into an S or a C corporation. As far as the state's concerned, you're still an LLC, all right. But from from a federal tax standpoint, you could be either an S or a C corporation. Now, I'm not a big fan of that because. When you do that, you go, you jump to the corporate level without doing bylaws, without directors, without without all the the corporate stuff that uh, that you really ought to have if you're going to have a corporation. If something bad happens down the road, you end up uh, liquidating this thing. Uh, worse yet, if there becomes a dispute amongst uh, shareholders or partners, and this in, this thing ends up in court. I always prefer to have the documents up to date with what you actually have. Uh, and that's, and that's just, that's just, I've seen bad things happen when uh, people have corporations and, and they say, well, let's see the agreement. Well, you know, and they, and they point to an LLC operating agreement or a, or a partnership uh, or a partnership agreement. Uh, it's not the same thing. So it, it, it opens a lot of stuff up towards the court making a lot of decisions uh, over stuff that uh, that that I think the the owner should have taken a part in when it originally happened. So uh, so it's it's easy to do that, and uh, and you can do that with virtually any uh, part. You know the general partnership, LLC, any of the any of the limited 
any of the limited partnerships you can do that with. I mean, any of these that we're going to look at have the option to get treated, to get taxed as a corporation if you want to. All right. So, but that's, that's completely optional. That's probably a conversation you need to have with, with your accountant. Okay. As far as most LLCs, this is, this is almost identical to the partnership folks. The LLC files its return, does not pay tax. The income flows via K-1, which is a two-page, uh, uh, basically, information sheet that, uh, that uh, uh, you punch in the numbers off the K-1 into the tax software, and that's how the individual, uh, the individual partners are, gonna, are going to uh, report that income on their individual return. So no tax paid at the LLC level, all the income flows to the individual partners, and that's where the uh, tax is going to get paid. LLCs typically are going to be subject to self-employment tax, especially in a production farming operation. Okay, let's talk the limited liability partnership. We talked about this a little earlier this morning. Uh, the uh, Typically, this is going to be the you know, most of the time this is a doctor's office or some type of a professional office might be an attorney. And uh, you, uh, you know, what this what this does is this offers protection between the partners. So the partners are only personally liable for their own negligence. They're not liable for another person's mistakes. All right. So that's that's kind of a key way of explaining the LLP. Now, we don't see these a lot in agriculture, but I, I see some application for this. I, I honestly can uh, see that. So, uh, so this, this is something where, you know, if the, if the liability between the partners is a, is a key element, you know, this might be a good option for you. Uh, and like all the limited liability, like all the limited partnerships uh, and the general partnership, you can't elect to tax this thing as a corporation if you decide to do so. Okay, as far as the LLP goes, uh, they're all formed under state law. So these get registered with the Secretary of State, just like you would a corporation, uh, but it, but it gets, reg gets registered with the Secretary of State initially. And then there's an annual report that has to go to the Secretary of State every year. Uh, typically these things are gonna operate as a partnership. Uh, unless the owners choose to be taxed as a corporation. So uh, under normal circumstances, this would get filed on 1065 and uh, you, would, you would operate the thing more or less as a general partnership. It's gonna be limited in nature by name and, uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, typically your general partners are going to pay self-employment tax. Uh, there can be limited partners involved with this, uh, and that's normally going to be passive, but, uh, you know, where that, that's getting a little deep on the tax side of things. Your limited partners are going to be investors only, and, uh, they're not going to have any kind of material participation involved in the operation. That's pretty much what it limit, what it, what it requires to not pay any self-employment tax on earnings. Okay, limited partnership. Now, this is the one where uh, you know you are going to have the general partner is going to oversee the oversee the business operations. There's going to be limited partners. You have to have in a limited partnership. You have to have both general and limited partners. Okay, you got to have at least one general partner and at least one limited partner. So the general partner is going to oversee the business. The limited partner is just going to be in it for the for the investment purposes. Now, the general partner's personal assets are exposed, whereas the limited partner's personal assets are protected. So that's one differentiation with the with the limited partnership. The general partner kind of operates as a sole proprietor of sorts. Uh, in the operation or as a partner in a general partnership with no liability protection, it's the, li it's the limited partner that has the liability protection in this particular case. Uh, it's, it's a pass through just like a general partnership or an LLC. And uh, it can be, a, you can elect to be to tax that thing as a corporation if you, if you see fit. Uh, again, Valley Fair, up in the cities, they they operate as a as a limited partnership. Okay, the family limited partnerships. Uh, just a sec here. I'm looking at the. 
Okay. Question is, could a spouse be a limited partner if they don't want anything to do with the business, but a desire to have limited liability protection for family assets? Um, Shannon, that is going to be more of a question. I, I would run that by an attorney, and here's why. I, I think your methodology on that is probably correct, but the problem is, is that when you have a married couple doing this, uh, I don't know how much you can isolate that uh, just by virtue of the marriage. So I'm, I'm going to defer to an attorney on that one because that, that's, true, that's truly an attorney question, and I do not know how that's going to work, but I'd, I'd say you need to probably uh, go with an attorney on that one. Okay, the family limited partnerships. The, uh, on the family limited partnerships, we, we talked about this again before lunch as well. The, uh, the, these are typically set up for preservation of generational wealth. Now, the, the, and, and the, the typical goal of setting up a family limited partnership is, is gifting to the next generation. The, uh, the, the, the typical setup here is usually you've got mom and dad are still alive and uh, there's kids uh, that, uh, that they wanna pass the farming operation to. They put all the land into the family limited partnership. And what they do is they do maximum gifting each year for uh, giving a portion of the land to the kids. All right, because remember, the, uh, we mentioned earlier, the, uh, right now for 2022, uh, the, the maximum uh, uh, gift that you can do without having to report it on a, on a, on a, on a gift tax return to $16,000. So I, I happen to be married and I happen to have two kids. So if, uh, if I was just talking cash, uh, you know, I can give my son $16,000, I can give my daughter $16,000, my wife can give our son $16,000 and our daughter $16,000. So you, you get the idea that if you got, if you got spouses, plus if you, if the, if the kids are married and we're giving money to in-laws, uh, holy smokes. I mean, that starts to magnify the amount of money that you can gift in one year and not be required to file a gift tax return. So uh, that that's the whole idea of this is uh, to get the land into a into a unit. And typically, mom and dad are going to be gifting <clears throat> those assets over time. And uh, it changes the percent ownership of the of the property. Now, a couple things that are not listed in the material, but I'm going to make, uh, you know, the, this is again, some soapbox uh, stuff that you want to, uh, to do. Any folks, anytime that you're gifting an asset, such as a, a, a portion of a per piece of property, uh, such as, uh, you know, if I'm giving $16,000 worth of land, uh, ownership of $16,000 worth of land to the kids, uh, that's not the same as cash, all right? The market value is subject to interpretation. And hopefully that's, that's gonna make sense to everybody. Uh, especially if, you know, this is something where we might be doing some discounting on it as well, meaning that we're gifting, we're, we're valuing the property lower than its actual market value, and we're gifting based on the discounted amount uh, there. It is highly recommended on my part and many, many tax professionals file those gift tax returns anyway. And here's the reason why. If you file a gift tax return on a gift that you do in 2022, where you're gift, gifting a portion of the land to the kids, if you file that thing in 2022, three years down the road, statute of limitations runs out and IRS cannot come back and challenge that market price because that's the part that they can argue about is they can say, well, actually that property should have been worth this amount of money. All right, that, that avoids that argument and it's, and it's cheap to file gift tax returns. So, you know, highly recommended that, uh, that you file those gift tax returns. Uh, it's also a good idea to have a lawyer draw up a little short letter 
uh, specifying the gift. You know, if you're giving $16,000 worth of property to son, daughter-in-law, you know, daughter, son-in-law, you know, on, on down the line, uh, that's, you know, in compared to the total cost of the estate, folks, it's pennies on the dollar. I mean, just, but, but those are some of the things that I highly recommend that you do. All right. And I apologize for, for the soapbox here because that, uh, you know, that that's getting a little more into what we do with, with farm estate transfer. The, uh, yeah, but as far as the family limited partnerships, uh, well, I already mentioned this, they're primarily set up to preserve that generational wealth and, uh, uh, you know, and you can, you can have the two partners there. Your general partners are typically going to be the ones that are operating the, the property and the limited partners. Uh, uh, a, a previous, previous example of one of these that I was filing a return for, it was a, it was a mother, father, there were four kids. One of the, one of the children was farming the operation. He was the general partner. The other siblings were all limited partners because they weren't actively engaged in farming. Okay. And formation of this, uh, it, get, it does get formed under state law. So it, initially any of these that you set up under the state all start with the secretary of state. Uh, it, get, it gets registered there. Uh, and like any of the limited partnerships, you know, you can opt to tax this thing as a corporation, although that's not really, you know, I, I would kind of recommend against that. Uh, and uh, the general partners are typically going to pay self-employment tax on their earnings. The limited partners are usually going to be passive because the only person actively conducting the business is going to be subject to the self-employment tax. So that's why the general partner is subject to self-employment tax. And in the, in the family limited partnership, hey, the, the, the general partner is going to be, the odds are, the child that's farming the farm. And uh, that's, that's why that uh, income will be subject to self-employment tax for them. Okay, C corporations. All right, now we're getting into uh, the, well, there, there's more to the corporation side of things. And I do not wish to overwhelm anybody. That's part of the reason why we sent, why, why we've got the booklet. But uh, again, the, the C corporation or the S corporation gives you personal asset protection, meaning I've repeated this time and time again, but the reason for this is I want you to remember this. When we're talking about liability protection, we are talking about preservation or protecting the personal assets, not making them available to satisfy business liabilities, right? That's what we're trying to protect. Assets that are in the corporation are fair game for a lawsuit. That doesn't that doesn't help anything. Uh, just 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 to have the assets in a corporation, it's still you're still able to you know you're still able to get sued. It's what we're trying to protect is the is the personal assets. Now, the uh, corporations are very very. It's very critical that uh, they maintain a strict governance on structure. All right, there has to be shareholders, directors, and officers. There has to be, uh, they have to be adequately capitalized, meaning they got to have enough money in the account to, to make sure that you, you can uh, take care of the affairs of the business. You got you to have it adequately capitalized. Uh, and it's not a substitute for insurance. We've mentioned this time and time again. Uh, but, uh, but, but you have to adhere to those uh, those governance items. Now, on formation, uh, you will and get involved. You will get an accountant and a lawyer involved if you do one of these. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is you have to appoint your directors, and those are the decision makers for the for the farm. If if it's a farming corporation, if it's a non farming corporation, doesn't matter. They're the directors of the are the decision makers. You have to draft and file articles of incorporation with your state. Those get filed with the Secretary of State. Do not try to do this on your own and download a set of sample articles of incorporation and then just file that with the, with the Secretary of State. That's, that's not a good idea. 
Uh, these things need to be tailored to your individual farm. Uh, draft bylaws, uh, that, that, that is again, uh, something that, uh, that needs to be done by, a, by an attorney. Second bullet and the third bullet are attorney things. All right. Odds are the attorney has a template that they're going to start with, but they need to tailor it to your individual operation. You have to hold an organizational meeting where you adopt your bylaws, elect your officers, you have to issue stock, all right? Because you have a corporate entity, stock gets issued to the shareholders and because uh, all the stock essentially reflects the total asset value of the corporation. All right, so you issue, you issue the, you approve the issuance of stock and then you actually issue the stock. And I highly create, suggest creating a shareholder agreement. It's similar to a partnership agreement or an LLC operating agreement, but it's still an agreement, all right? And it specifies all of those things that we talked about on the partnership side of things. Now, operationally, uh, keep your business and financial affairs separate. This is a requirement, folks. You can't use the corporate checking account as your personal checking account. You know, don't start putting groceries and Walmart trips and all sorts of stuff uh, in, the, in the corporate account. Uh, I, ha I have, I've never seen it personally, but I've read a lot of articles where uh, IRS, upon reviewing, uh, you know, when, when they did an audit on, uh, on a corporation, if they find that, uh, that this was not adhered to, it voided the whole, the whole corporate status. I mean, basically, they went back to a, back to a sole proprietorship, all right? And so it, it voids all your liability protection. So it's real important not to commingle those funds. All right, follow your bylaws. Uh, hold your annual meetings, and, and that's another thing that, that uh, I have been asked for before in an audit. Uh, you, you need to have a meeting every year of the board of directors, and you have to type up the minutes, and you really ought to keep those minutes in a notebook, and I've been asked for the notebook on several occasions. Uh, that's one of the first things they're looking for because they want to make sure that you're adhering to all the guidelines if you have that corporate status. Uh, you got a annual maintenance fee uh, with the state that has to be paid to the Secretary of State every year. And uh, you also have to designate your tax status. And this, this is more, this is actually more applicable for the S corporation, but I think it's, I think it's, uh, I'll mention it now since it's on the slide. You, everything starts out as a C corporation. All right. If, if you ultimately are going to form an S corporation, well, initially when you form the corporation, you form a C. You have to file an additional form to make it an S corporation. So, and, and believe it or not, that's a form that gets forgotten about more than what you think it is. Uh, just to illustrate that, I would say in the last five years at our, uh, income tax course, we've probably talked about that at least three or four times in the last five years. Uh, it, it's, it's an issue with, with internal revenue. There, there are, uh, there's uh, safe harbors that a person can follow if that gets forgotten about. You got up to three years to fix it uh, where it's going to be fairly painless, but uh, uh, that, that's something that you do have to do. Uh, but if you're a C corporation, you don't have to do anything. Uh, with it because it because it, it defaults to a C corporation. Now the C corporations they pay their own tax on their own return. Uh, the C corporation gets filed on a form 1120. Uh, the money gets passed through the C corporation to the shareholders in the form of all right salaries are a way to get money out of a C corp rent or paying out dividends. All right so the C corporation files its own tax return pays its own tax, and then that money that flows out to the uh, shareholders in the way of payment of salary, rent, dividends, that money gets, uh, the tax gets paid on that on those individual tax returns. Now, uh, 
if we were in a live session, I would ask the group, has anybody heard of QBI? All right, qualified business income. Odds are most everybody has. The QBI came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act back in 2017. That was the big tax reform bill that we had. During that point in time, corporations were granted, C-corporations were, were, uh, were put at a flat tax rate of 21%. All right, so, so we, there's just a flat tax rate of 21% for C corporations. And uh, there's no qualified business income for that. Now, uh, the, the brief amount of history that'll make the, that'll hopefully uh, cause, cause this to make sense to you is uh, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, all C corporations had a 21% tax rate. Well, the tax rates didn't apply to all other entities. So sole proprietors, partners, and everything else, you know, they didn't get that flat tax rate like what the, what the corporations did. As a carrot to appease the rest of the folks, this is where QBI came from, which is a 20% deduction that, uh, that can be taken on essentially any entity other than uh, a C corporation can, can take QBI. Uh, I've spent an inordinate amount of time since 2017 uh, uh, talking about QBI and, and uh, how it interrelates. In fact, I've, I've written some of the stuff for some of the national textbooks on this. So, uh, but, uh, but just no QBI for C corporations. For everything else, uh, we do get that. All right, and here's the flow chart for how we look at that taxes for the, for the C corporation. C corporation files its own tax return, pays its own tax, but uh, money flows out of this thing in the way of wages, rent, dividends, and then that money gets reported as income on the individual shareholders return. All right, so thus you get the double taxation, all right. All right, anything anybody's got on C Corporation? Actually, let me let me touch on one quick one quick additional thing here. We didn't it not we mentioned it earlier this morning, and I want to reiterate it. Uh, C corporations never put land in those things. I mean, never put land in a C corporation. I mean, putting land into an S corporation is not horrible. Uh, some some people have a problem with it, but uh, but it's you know getting it out is is not is not a tax horrendous thing like what it is for a C corporation. Uh, the uh, if if you have a C corporation that's been in existence for years and years and years and years, and you need to and you need to unwind it, the best way to unwind a C corporation is to convert it to an S corporation and operate it that way for five years, and then you automatically get to waive all the built-in gains tax from the C corporation. So if you do have that C corporation and you need to liquidate, you know you're gonna to have to liquidate that thing sometime down the road, convert it to an S, operate it five years, and it makes, that, makes it a much less painful pill to swallow. Okay, any questions out there on the on the C corps before I before I drive on to the to the S corps? And this this could be a little bit of that uh, after lunch uh, after lunch trying to keep everybody awake. All right, seeing none on the S corporation. Uh, some of this is going to be repeat from from what we had. Uh, talked about with the with the c corporations you do get with the s corporation you do get to protect those personal assets from business liability so you got that asset protection uh liability protection with the with the uh, s corporation the uh you do also have to adhere to the governance structure as far as shareholders directors officers this is going to be almost be identical to the C corporation. You have to have it adequately capitalized. You got to have enough money in the account to, to make sure that you can run the, run the show. You can't commingle the business and the personal uh, expenses in the corporate checking account. There needs to be a corporate checking account. That's just for the corporation and uh, you can't commingle it. 
CNS Corporation are going to have to fill out a balance sheet on the tax return, just like the general partnership may have to. And that means you got to account for every penny. So, uh, you know, you, you can't commingle the funds. Uh, not a substitute for insurance. We've, we've kind of driven that home earlier. Uh, formation, this is going to be almost identical. Appoint the directors, draft articles of incorporation, draft bylaws. Remember, bullet two, bullet three are lawyer things. Uh, you got to hold that organizational meeting. Keep a notebook for, uh, for minutes and everything. Adopt the bylaws, which are written by the attorney. You also got to elect officers. Uh, issue stock. And uh, then you also have to decide whether you're going to elect S status or not. Because uh, I meant, mentioned this earlier. All corporations start as a C and then you elect where it's going from there. So with... Uh, with, with the case of this, the if you want an S corporation, you, you form the corporation and then somebody's got to file the 2553. And that's how, that's how you elect the S status. Now, here's what happens, folks. Your accountant is going to think that the attorney is going to file that form. Your attorney is going to think the accountant is going to file that form. Well, I don't think I have to tell you what happens sometimes. It doesn't get filed. So all parties think that, uh, well, we filed, we filed the form to elect S status. So then we start filing S, S corporation returns. And about two years later, a letter shows up from Internal Revenue saying, why are you filing an S corporation return when we think you're a C corporation? Uh, and end result is, is the 2553 never got filed. This, some would probably think, oh, this is more detail, Rob, than what you need to get into. But, you know, if you're forming one of these things, I think that's important to know because absence of this 2553 getting filed, it's just a pain. Uh, there, there's a, uh, there are options for late filing if the 2553 gets, gets, uh, gets forgotten about it has to be done within a little over three i think it's three years three months and a certain number of days but uh but uh there's provisions in there to uh to allow that uh but but uh but it's real critical and and nobody likes getting those letters from internal revenue like that uh so it's it's real important to be aware that that's got to happen uh and uh the shareholder agreement is I think critical, just like it is for the C Corp, just like it is for any of the limited partnerships or a general partnership. I think those agreements are, are really, really critical. So uh, on the, as far as the operation goes, keep your business and the personal finances separate. In other words, uh, in the corporate bank account, do nothing but corporate business. Uh, for grocery money and everything, there's going to be, you know, money needs to be, you know, taken out of the corporation uh, in the way of a salary or rent or some means there, uh, you know, typically there's going to be salaries that are going to be paid out of there by the personal stuff out of the personal checkbook. Okay, you need to follow your bylaws and hold your annual meetings, pay your state annual maintenance fees and designate your tax status. All right, we already talked about that. As far as corp, as far as taxation goes, now this this is a little different from the from the C corporation. Your your uh, share of profits and losses in an S corporation are allocated based on the average number of shares owed for the year. So the the profit percentage that goes to shareholders is dictated by law. All right, in a partnership. In a general partnership, in an LLC, we can do special allocations to uh, get money out of the out of the uh, entity. S corporation does not offer that flexibility. It's based in money that comes out of this thing is based on the the share of profits and losses by you know based on the number of shares owned, and uh, so there's no special allocations that are allowed on this whatsoever. All right, the, uh, we do need to 
calculate basis. We talked about basis a little bit earlier. Uh, that's real critical in an S corporation, just like it is in any pass through entity. Typically, you want your accountant to calculate that, but ultimately, it's the taxpayer that's responsible for that. If you if you if you dig into the IRS Treasury regulations, ultimately, it falls to the to the taxpayer. But but uh, you know, it's something that you want to have the accountant calculate. Um, and so if you have losses, big time losses in an S, in an S corporation, that's, that's a subject for, uh, audits. I mean, that's a, that's a frequent reason that S corporations get audited. If they have losses year after year after year, they're going to, they're going to audit those things. And they're going to look to see whether you've got basis in that, uh, in that corporation, because if you don't, those losses are going to be suspended. The uh, self-employment tax deduction. Now, here's where the tax savings comes from an S corporation, because those earnings coming through on the K-1 from the S corp are not going to be subject to self-employment tax. They're exempt from self-employment tax. But S corporations are required to pay shareholders a salary, and that's where you're going to have FICA and Medicare withholding on that. That's where the self-employment tax gets paid for an S corporation. All right. Now, the, the key gray area that you need to look at on this is there is no quick and dirty formula for what that appropriate salary is. Uh, you know, I've seen ridiculously uh, high profit numbers with a $10,000 salary, and the IRS did not find that satisfactory at all. It needs to be a, an appropriate salary. Uh, there, uh, there is, the next slide here, uh, bo bottom of this slide here, there is an IRS reasonable compensation job aid, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the tax professionals that go to our tax schools will uh, will still reference that it started to get a little bit of age to it but the 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 uh, formulas and guidance that it provides is still valid but uh, but it, it it helps out in determining what that reasonable salary should be but but the reasonable salary is where the self employment taxes is, is paid so where the tax savings comes into play is you know let's say you've got a um, uh, several people that are uh, several family members are involved in this S corporation. Let's say the S corporation makes $250,000. Uh, you might only have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of salary being paid out of that. So if it was an LLC, you'd be paying self-employment tax on the 250,000. Whereas with the S corporation, with that, with that salary, you're only paying really salary on a hundred, on a hundred grand. So that's where, that's where the difference comes, and that's where the tax savings occurs. Now, the the graphic here, S corporation files its own tax return, uh, but it doesn't pay any tax. The income goes via K one to the shareholder, and then that income gets reported on their individual returns. That's where the tax gets paid. Okay. Salary. I already mentioned this reasonable compensation job aid. In fact, if you just go to the go Google that, uh, that'll pop right up on the IRS website. It's still a uh, it's still a uh, that's still a, a fast way to to get to that job aid. All right, QBI. Uh, as far as the uh, QBI goes for S corporations, they do get that twenty percent uh, that twenty percent deduction. Uh, and it, well, in fact, QBI works for everything except a C corporation, everything except a C corporation. It's a 20% deduction off qualified business income and farm income. You know, if you've got income from sales of commodity, livestock, uh, that's all going to be typically uh, uh, farm, farm income. Uh, so, so, uh, what that QBI is, is that's a, that's a 20% deduction off your net profit from farm is, uh, what happens the, uh, and again, C corporations are excluded from QBI. Now that all sunsets in 2025. All right. And that was per the, uh, tax cuts and jobs act. So, uh, we've only got that for, for a few more years. Yeah. See here, I see a question here. 
Gift tax return on LLC shares gifting to children. We use an attorney. Yes, good point. Good point. Yes, you know when gifting, gifting anything that could be subject to interpretation, I think is a good idea for doing doing gift tax returns. Now, uh, folks, I, I'm going to apologize for this. I think I have four or five slides here on fringe benefits. I will send you when I send you the link to the, uh, excuse me, when I send you the link to the evaluation, which uh, I will either do this afternoon or in the morning, it depends on how soon Zoom gets me, a, gets me a list of people that were on the webinar today. I will send that as an attachment with that email, uh, but it's just a, it's got, I think it's got four or five slides on there. But I wanted to, I, I, early on in the, uh, in the programs, I was getting a, a large number of questions on fringe benefits and how those kind of interact and interplay with the, uh, with the different entities that we have. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, the key thing is here is you're always gonna have excludable fringe benefits uh, and those aren't allowed for the owner. So, uh, so in the case of a sole proprietorship, uh, the, the sole proprietor is going to be for health insurance. There's the self-employed health insurance deduction, which allows you deduction for the, for the health insurance expense, but it doesn't reduce self-employment tax. And that's probably the number one thing that, uh, that that's kind of ouchy on that, uh, other than the fact that the premiums are ridiculous when we, we, we know that. Uh, the, uh, you know, dependent care assistance, fringe benefits, de minimis fringe benefits, uh, working condition fringe benefits. In other words, uh, uh, you know, owners, uh, the, uh, if, if, if you're an owner of an operation, and uh, you're providing housing to a, to a hired hand that uh, say you had a livestock operation, you had a, a, a house on the farm close to the uh, hog operation, you were, you were uh, providing that housing to that, uh, to that employee. That's an excludable fringe benefit to the employee, but it has to be a requirement that they, that they live in that house. I mean, you're, you're providing that to them so they can be close to the farming operation and available for uh, emergency calls. So, uh, so th those are the, but, but owners themselves can't take that type of a benefit. I mean, that's not available in a sole proprietorship. The uh, health insurance, most commonly, it's gonna be a self-employed health insurance deduction. Uh, now, one thing that you can do is uh, you can do the Section 105 plans. Now, real, real quickly, what, what, we, what a Section 105 plan is, is it's a health reimbursement arrangement. Uh, they, they've renamed these things recently. The acronym is ICRA. Uh, individual stands for individual coverage health reimbursement arrangement. This is uh, something that can be a substitute for, for health insurance uh, that you provide to employees. It's, uh, it's a tax-free benefit uh, if you provide it to employees. Uh, and the way to work around that for the, uh, for the sole proprietors is you employ your spouse. You employ your spouse, you put the insurance in the spouse's name, and, uh, you know, that way it's provided to an employee and that makes that uh, health insurance premium 100% deductible. All right. So this is something that's been around for 30 plus years. So, uh, you know, if you're not aware of that, I'd certainly encourage you to, you know, drop me a line. I'll be happy to uh, share some material with you on that. But, uh, but that can be significant tax savings, especially you know, the, the way premiums and everything are right now, if you, you, cause you get a business, turn that into a business deduction that reduces self-employment tax. And uh, that that's definitely a, uh, a, a positive on that. On uh, partnerships. Uh, now part, partners are eligible for some excludable benefits. Uh, and typically what happens is those are reported as a guaranteed payment to partner. Uh, which is going to be a taxable event. Uh, typically, well, yeah, that's that's the way health insurance happens with a uh, with a with a general partnership. Uh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get a gen you're going to get a guaranteed payment to partner for the amount of the premium that gets reported as income on their return, and then uh, they take that as a uh, self-employed health insurance deduction. 
on their uh, individual return. For fringe, for uh, S corporations, uh, primarily, uh, you know, just, just, just let's talk the health insurance that does get added to the W-2 and then it gets taken as a uh, self-employed health insurance deduction. They can have de minimis uh, tax-free benefits, uh, accident, health, accident, uh, accident uh, plans, $50,000 worth of health uh, insurance, meals and lodging furnished for the employer's convenience, and you need to kind of talk to your tax prepare about that because they've they've recently uh, updated the rules on that and it got unfortunately more complicated. C corporations now C corporations uh, th this is this you can do the same thing that General Motors does folks. I mean you can offer a cafeteria plan uh, with uh, with fringe. I mean fringe is a lot easier and a lot more flexible with the C corporation. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you just can't discriminate amongst your employees if they're uh, if 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 you have multiple employees um, you can't uh, you know there's there's non-discrimination rules that you have to follow on that but uh, but but those are those are the items that uh, that you're going to find under those uh, under those guidelines the uh, okay before I get into too much here I got a question here uh, about uh, recap the 125 percent limitation. Uh, you have multiple partnerships in the LLC. Okay, just a minute. Let's see. I'm not sure I understand the second part of the question here, but let me address the first one here. The question is about uh, the the cap of the 125 percent. Excuse me, the 125 thousand dollar limitation for for farm program payments. If you're in a sole proprietorship, uh, and uh, well, let's let's start let's start this again. If we've got a qualified joint venture where we have a husband and wife, they're both materially participating. Both husband and wife are both going to get a hundred twenty-five thousand dollar limit. In a case of a partnership, general partnership, uh, all partners say there's four brothers involved in this partnership. Each brother is going to get $125,000 limitation for FS for the uh, FSA limitations. The uh, once you jump in now, now the key element here is that they have to be materially participating. They can't just be a limited partner in the uh, in the farming operation. They have to be actually farming. All right. Once you get to the LLC, all right, LLC is uh, is one $125,000 limit for the entire entity. Same thing for the uh, LLP, for the LP, for the FLP, for the S Corp, for the C Corp. All those entities are, are gonna be capped at 125,000 for the entire entity. All right, so that, that's the deal on the 125,000. I'd recommend if you, you may want to shoot me an email on the second part of your question. I'm not quite sure uh, what what you're getting at on that. Back over here on uh, on the, the this is a recap in the book here, just kind of illustrating what's going on with all our different entities. I tried to kind of capture what uh, you know the 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 ben the advantages and disadvantages of uh, of your different entities you know remember the sole proprietorship i mean the main dis the main disadvantage is that there's no liability protection it's simple uh owner gets all the profits there's really no tax advantages to it but uh but the main thing is is it's easy to get into easy to get out it's easy to manage uh, there's there's no formal anything to it qualified joint venture is uh, on the qualified joint venture no liability protection you got to have sp two spouses uh, both actively participating in the in the operation in order to qualify as a joint venture that's where you're doing a split schedule f on the return and it just we're just dividing the set of books in half uh, easy record keeping no formal arrangements or anything along those lines general partnership uh no, no limit to liability on this one either. But, uh, you know, typically it's easy to get into these things, but uh, it does require more bookkeeping. Uh, I highly recommend 
a separate bank account because because again if you're over that uh if you're over that two hundred fifty thousand dollar asset amount you know you got to file a balance sheet on there so it, there is some additional bookkeeping that has to occur with uh with the general partnership the uh llc's the main reason why people do LLCs is they're simple. I mean, you get the liability protection, they operate like a general partnership, but they're simple. All right, they're, they're simple. Uh, no real tax advantages to that. Uh, the LLP, the, uh, this is the one that typically it's gonna be for the, for the professionals. Now in our discussions, we're kind of thinking that the, this might have some farm applications, but, but you know, the typical, application for this is is it's in a professional's office and it protects the other you know uh, to, it protects one partner from the mess up of another partner all right they're they're not they're not liable for the for the uh, mess ups of the other partner uh you know more record keeping you know anytime you get into a partnership there's going to be more record keeping on that uh the the lp got to have at least one general partner one limited partner uh, general partner is in charge of the operation. Limited partner is, uh, of course, uh, you know, is just a, just generally an investment, an investor in that. Uh, earlier in the program, somebody referred to this as more of a corporate farming type of thing, and I think that's that's a very good analogy. Uh, more record keeping, but but still uh, can file on a on a regular partnership return. Family limited partnership. We spent a lot of time on this one, uh, just because there was a lot of interest in it. The uh, remember the family limited partnership is uh, mainly set up for generational wealth. It's mainly set up to facilitate gifting to the next generation. So uh, that 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 in time that in turn. You know, you you put all the land into the family limited partnership. If mom and dad still own the ground, they're they're uh, gifting portions of that uh, every single year. I do recommend filing gift tax returns on those transactions every year, even though there's not going to be any tax due on it. C and S corporation. Uh, now on the C corporation, uh, it it's a it's it files its own tax return. It pays its own tax. It uh, you you only get money out of a C corporation through wages, dividends, and rent, and uh, you know it pays its own tax, and then the shareholders pay that pay that tax on you know whatever was paid to them in the way of rent, dividends, and uh, wages. The uh, key thing there is never put land into a C corporation. Uh, there's a lot of tax advantages in that there's some deductions that you get with a C corporation that you wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise get in a sole proprietor or any other type of entity. Uh, the bad part about it is, is they're really, really expensive to unwind. S corporation is essentially a pass-through entity. It files its own tax return, but it doesn't pay any tax, All right? All the profits pass through to the shareholders. That's where the income tax gets paid on that money. And, uh, you know, there's no, you know, S corporation, there's no, uh, there's, uh, you know, everything passes through on, uh, on that particular, uh, that particular piece. And uh, remember the S corporation, there's no self-employment tax that's paid on the uh, pass-through earnings, but the S corporation is required to pay salaries to shareholders. Okay, and this this uh, is another this is another review chart. There's a couple of review charts. I'm going to just leave that to your perusal on the, that's in the material. And uh, what we want to do next is uh, our and uh, what we want to do uh, one of the papers that I handed out. It was just a more or less. It was a uh, just a just a bare sheet of paper with some with some numbers on it that uh, that allowed everybody to kind of write down steps. And I think we can just accomplish this through the chat. But uh, what, I, what I'd, uh, you know, if, if we were in a face-to-face uh, -face session with, with uh, you know, with 41 people involved with this, I would, uh, what I would do is uh, we'd, we'd break up into groups of four or five and I'd give, give everybody a different uh, group to talk about. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of brainstorm the tasks that we would need to go through in order to form 
that particular entity. And uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is I think I think in in the interest of time with this and and what we're what we're doing here, uh, let's just assume that we are all uh, in the same farming operation. It's a it's a you know, big farming operation here. But uh, let's say that we are forming an S corporation, all right? The, the goal in mind here is we are forming an S corporation. And what I'd like everybody to do is I'd like uh, folks to brainstorm in the chat what your initial steps are going to be. And now, now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to place this, the, the assumption is, is that the family has already met and they've already made this decision. So, so as far as the family decision side of things, that decision has been made. We decided we're going to go with an S corporation. Uh, at that point in time, what, what's our, what, what are some, what are some of our next steps? And I don't expect everybody to write down all the, all the stuff on the, you know, we're, we, we're not, I'm not really too interested in the, uh, in the bylaws and the electing officers and all that. I'm, I'm more or less interested in, uh, uh, I'm more or less interested in what your what your initial steps are, uh, you know, as the family unit. What are you going to do? Okay, we see established goals. Oh, wonderful, Mike! Kudos to you. Complete, accurate balance sheets. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't talk too much about uh, doing possibly a potentially a fin pack on any of this stuff, but you know, doing some cash flows and balance sheets and make sure that this uh, business we we never we never really talked about that all that much, but that is excruciatingly important. Uh, excellent answer. Who's the first person you're going to call? Should be a list of like two people that uh, that you're going to call initially. Okay, the attorney and the tax accountant. Very good, very good. All right, uh, I see those coming in. Thank you very much. Uh, plus, we got to file with the Secretary of State and apply for the you know EIN and all that. Yeah, and and boy, another another note here: FinPAC is a must. Uh, that uh, that is uh, that is critical, critical. I, I'm I'm a person that's done. A lot of fin, a lot of fin ans over the years, and uh, that is, uh, you know, combination of a fin an and uh, and a long range plan. I think is is critical to that. So uh, I think you're well on your way. The, the 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 main idea behind that was to establish the fact that you do need to involve your tax professional and your legal professional, the uh, because you you need them involved. Uh, to, in order for this, especially for the liability protection to be in force, you need to have well-written uh, bylaws and corporate documents uh, in order for that, that to work. Under no circumstances, and I, I don't want to pick on LegalZoom.com, but I think, I think that, that downloading templates like that, I think, has gotten a lot of people in trouble. Uh, down the road. I'm not, I'm not going to mince words about it. Uh, you know, there are certain things that are okay to do on your own. This is not one of them. Uh, that's it. Um, yep. And Tina, I've got to com comment from, uh, from uh, Tina out here after FinPAC file is up to date, find a tax account that understands agriculture, very critical for farm transition that's coming from an FBM instructor. So take that, take that to note. They're, they're getting their hands dirty with this stuff all the time. So uh, good food for thought folks. And that was really the idea that we wanted to have. And, you know, if we were live face to face, of course we would have, uh, you know, th it, this is the discussion that I, that I miss in a, uh, in an environment like this. Uh, let's do a real quick wrap up here, folks. Uh, what I wanted to do here, uh, you know, we've got uh, in your material, we've got, got some things that we'll uh, pull together. 
Uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, Megan Roberts, former colleague of mine, now she works for Minnesota State, uh, you know, assembled this and put this into our our uh, farm estate transfer material. And I thought it was a good thing. Uh, so we stuck it in the in the business entity materials as well. So, uh, you know, the, and the whole idea of this is, is just looking at structure taxation, liability formation, ease of exit and outside investment. It's, it's you know, it's giving you a smiley face or a upside down smiley face as far as whether it's good or bad. And uh, that's, that's just something good for reference. I do want to draw references to, uh, to a couple things. Uh, uh, for those of you that got the mailed, the, the mailed book, there, uh, if you go to the very, very back of that uh, printed book, there are uh, there's a couple of fact sheets at the very back of that uh, of that book, and I want to let's see here. It's on page. Okay, there's uh, on page 75 of the of the printed books uh, is a is a legal fact sheet called "Choosing the Right Business Entity." Now that was written by. Uh, uh, attorneys out of out of St. Cloud, and uh, and actually we we st we started we started with that it was started with an extension publication and then they updated that and then we ended up uh, converting it over to where it was uh, where it was able to be posted on the on the on the website page eighty two it's got a it's got a uh, uh, another fact sheet called restrictions on farm entities and that's where it talks a little more deep discussion on uh, corporate farm law and everything along those lines. So, uh, you know, but uh, the, the, key, the key element where I'm going with this is the, the extension farm legal series. And I jump forward a couple of slides. This is the website address for that entire legal series. I think there's 14 different fact sheets and it, it covers everything from, uh, entities to land ownership to uh, leases, uh, you name it. There's there's a wide variety of items that I would uh, I would bring to your bring to your uh, attention on that. The uh, the the other references that I wanted to point out uh, uh, for for those that uh, I guess consider themselves more lay people with regards to uh, with regards to this material, I'm. Uh, uh, that, well, for instance, the, the top item on this on this slide, where the the same one where the where the uh, legal series link is, uh, there's a there's a series of books uh, that are put out by uh, Nolo. It's uh, N O L O. Uh, they're uh, they they put together a whole series of uh, books. Uh, I guess the the ones that I own. Uh, there's one called Tax Savvy for Small Business. There's one on forming partnerships. There's another one I own called uh, LLC or corporation. Uh, for those of you that remember the, uh, you know, the computer books for dummies or idiots, uh, I think that name is condescending myself, but, uh, but, but any of you that have ever picked one of those up, it takes complicated issues and it puts it into simple terms. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I like the, I like the Dolo books. They're, they're available on Amazon. They're, very reasonably priced, and that's something that you might want to consider <clears throat> possibly picking up if you uh, if you have uh, you know if you have interest in doing some additional reading on that. Uh, with that, folks, I am looking at uh, okay. Let's see here. Okay, question is: Is it difficult to change a farm name for any of these? The uh, uh, and the question for that is. Is it would just it it has to be re-registered with the Secretary of State if you're going to change if you're going to change an existing entity to another name uh, you probably will need an attorney to do that because you're going to have to file that with the Secretary of State you'll have to update that name with your tax ID number or very likely just get a new tax ID number uh, there's there's a there's a fair amount of work to it I don't I wouldn't say that any single step is is really difficult, but uh, but it's there's going to be a lot of steps to it. So, uh, any I guess any final questions as we're kind of uh, as we're kind of I'm kind of in the in the wrap up mode here a little bit. We've got you know we we certainly have some 
time to take a to take a few questions here if uh, if need be. Um, and I certainly uh, what I will do. Let me let me let me recap here and get my email address up here, and then we'll we'll do the wrap up. Do want to do some acknowledgments here? Uh, remember Farm Commons. Uh, that's Rachel Armstrong. Rachel reviewed all of our material that we have uh, that we had in the book. Uh, booklet that we were using today. Uh, she is an attorney. Uh, she heads up Farm Commons. Uh, please, you know, check her material out. Uh, they do have a, they do have a certain amount of free information on their website, but they also uh, have information for a fee. There's there's more stuff accessible, so they they have to get their bills paid as well. Uh, also, want to thank the Minnesota State uh, University uh, Farm Business Management Program. Uh, several of their Instructors are on the call today, and I uh, want to thank them for all their help and uh, and promotion and everything. Uh, also, want to acknowledge the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center uh, for this grant funding, which uh, helped pay for all this uh, educational programming. There's my contact information. That's my old phone number, but I think that thing is still going to be ringing the rest of the week. Honestly, what I would do is I'd shoot me an email. Shoot, shoot me an email. Uh, the whole Kamar at umn.edu is not going to change. So uh, that's my that's my email address there. And with that, uh, there's our other contacts, Dave Bow, Nathan Holinsky. I want to thank Nathan today for uh, for helping out with the instruction. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the help. So with that, uh, folks, we stand essentially. Uh, we, we, we essentially stand uh, more or less finished up here. The, uh, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, actually, I'm, what I'm gonna suggest here, I'm, is, is since we're, uh, get, I'm getting some, getting some questions that are kind of uh, on a different topic, what I'd recommend is uh, folks, those of you that are asking about uh, nonprofits and uh, 1031 exchanges, I'd say, why don't you shoot me an email because we're gonna probably uh, end the recording here and uh, I, can, I can take care of that with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, with that folks, uh, what I'd ask is uh, if you could, uh, uh, at, the at the lower right-hand portion of your screen, we're essentially done. Uh, if uh, if you could uh, hit the end now button, uh, when you hit the end now button, you will be taken into your, uh, you, you'll, you'll get the evaluation that will pop up automatically on your computer screen. If you could fill out that evaluation, I would greatly appreciate that. We like the feedback on that. Uh, folks, I will uh, either late this afternoon or first thing in the morning, I will send out a reminder link to the evaluation. Uh, if you fill it out this afternoon, you know, just that's fine. Just don't fill it out. Don't, don't please don't fill it out twice. You know, we, we'd like one from everybody. But uh, I will also send the attachment with the uh, fringe benefit slides. I'll send that out with that link as well. So I think folks, we will stand adjourned and uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you for attending today and uh, have a good afternoon. Did you stop the recording? <clears throat> um, okay.